And we're live here from uh, Lake of the Ozarks for me. I know Duffy's, or you think you're home right now in Michigan. And uh, Jake, are you uh, currently home in Kentucky? Um, well, Indiana. I'm from Kentucky, but I live right across the river in Indiana. Across the border. Okay. Yeah, Indiana. Across the nice. border. Nice. So if I'm a little blurry, I apologize. The lighting in the hotel uh, is not great uh, in this room. I tried to open the blinds. and <laughs> I look like something out of a movie. So we opted to close the blinds and go with the dark mode. But uh, this is episode 36. I'm Nick. That's Sean Duffy. Uh, we're your host. And we are honored to have our friend, cohort, uh, fellow instructor, Jake Barnes on the show tonight. Jake, welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much. I, I, like I said earlier, I'm really, really honored to be here. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, man, this is, uh, it's been a long time coming and uh, it's been an honor to be on your show. So we kind of flip the script and have you on our show. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So uh, let's start with a little background uh, and just kind of give us, you know, a little bit about yourself, long walk on the beach, so I that, where you, like, uh, you know, getting accosted by Sean Duffy at FDIC, whatever you want to bring up, man. It's cool. You, you bring up yeah, so- things that interest you, things, <laughs> what, <laughs> what is Jake Barnes about? Well, so I, I, I'll tell you about how I got the fire service, got started in the military and the Air Force as a firefighter, didn't want to, uh, they kind of made me one. They, I got four choices and the last slot was they had to pick something, right? And backdraft was out and I didn't care about the fourth slot because I knew I was getting the other two, the other like th- three jobs, one of those. And then, uh, no, they made me a firefighter. And then when I went my lab, burnt, my first live burn, that was it. I was hooked. I was just, I mean, I was off gassing and melting masks and I mean, it was just a nightmare. I loved it. Then I went to Lexington, Kentucky for eight years and now I've been up in New Albany Fire Department for almost 20, 20 in January. So it's been fun. Uh, yeah, hot jazz, cool blues. Uh, now I want to go to FDIC every year just in case I get accosted again by uh, Sean Duffy, uh, <laughs> the kissing bandit. He runs around FDIC and surprises, you know, dudes and kisses them. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, and we have we have video documentation of this, which I'm going to put up soon. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> no denying that one. <laughs> what else? Um, what else you want to know about yeah, me? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, what, do you, see, what do you got uh, going on in life? So I'm close to retirement, and so I'm fiddling with that. I'm like, man, maybe I can retire and do my side hustle, uh, and just do that, or put in for other departments, maybe. So I'm, I'm kind of I'm right at that crossroads where I'm like. Either I'm going to stay for a while or I'm just going to cut and run. Um, but whatever I do, I want to keep teaching. I mean, you all know that's that's like the best thing. I, that really gets you going. And if you're having a bad time at work and go teach somewhere else and it's it just kind of re- revitalizes you. Um, see, I got one wife, four sex trophies, one dog, six cats. Uh, let's see. Uh I'm not that interesting. I think that's about it. I mean, really, on my tombstone, it'll just say Jake's under here and it'll be pointing down. I, nothing fantastic. I'm I'm not remarkable in any way, shape, form at all. I don't know. I think six tri- sex trophies is pretty remarkable, buddy. <laughs> Four sex trophies. Four. I said, oh, you said six. That's a lot of kids. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I lose count of them all. They all kind of blur <laughs> together. I'm getting older. And I'm just like, which one are you again? Right. I thought you moved out. Like I'm yeah, seven. Right. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, you know, you're what you're, you're right about one thing there is uh teaching and mm-hmm. uh how it rejuvenates you. Uh I would say that uh you know, I don't know a whole lot. I know a lot about a little. You know, mm-hmm. I always try and remain a student of the craft, but when I got into sharing what I did know and my experiences, just the opportunities that came from that and meeting like-minded people and everything like that, it just man, there's nothing better than that. You know, it's, no. it, it is almost like a drug. You just get, you get so much positivity from that, you know, and it's just, you're always looking forward to the next time, you know? So that's would exactly urge, it. Yeah. I, and I would urge anybody who's got a desire to do that, to get out there and at least give it a shot. Well, I think at the end of the day, man, like it, it's good to be around people who, you know, like-minded guys that and gals that think the same way that are, you know, you, you get in your little bubble sometimes in your fire departments and you, and you kind of, lose sight of how big the fire service is. I mean, it, it's, it's the biggest small family ever. You know what I'm saying? It, it's, it's, it's yeah. crazy because like everywhere you go, you run into people like, Oh yeah, I know that guy or, you know, someone who knows somebody. And, but so it really is a small world, but you, when you get in your little bubble, sometimes your little box and you forget that there's stuff outside your four walls 
And, mm-hmm. you know, you go to a conference and, you, and you're, you know, taking classes, you're teaching, you're whatever, you're sharing knowledge and passion and, and camaraderie. And, man, it just, it just, you know, fills you back up. It fills the gas tank back up. And, and it helps you, you know, remember why you got into it all those years ago. Right. And I never wanted to be an instructor. I don't know about you all. That was never a goal. Um, I, I got an instructor one simply because they were offering it and they were, it was probably going to be on the, uh, promotional system that they were working on at the time. Didn't really use it that much. And then I got, um, a chance to be the training officer. And I talked so much shit about the previous training officer, not as a person, but like, we're not doing enough training, blah, blah, blah. So when I got offered it, I was like, now you gotta take it, asshole. And so I did. And, uh, I really fell in love with it. I did. And once you get past the part that as, as somebody that a, a fire instructor, that you're not expected to knowing, to know everything, you take that out of the plate. Cause that was my biggest thing. I was like, uh, I, I'm now the training officer of this fire department. I've got to know everything. So I started to read everything I could and it just can't be done. But once you realize, no, no, you're not the expert in everything. You know, you're the training officer. You, you do the best you can and you use your subject matter experts. You learn constantly, hopefully, but it's not all on you. And once I kind of settled into that, man, that was it. And then I got to teach uh, for the ISFSI and travel. And that was it. Like you all said, it's just if, if you know how work is up and down, sometimes you love it, sometimes you hate it. I mean, you always love the fire service, but, you know, sometimes you get people that you work with that kind of drag you down. And then you go somewhere where people pay to hear you talk and you know, come up to you and, and then they give you information so you can take that to the next class. It is a drug. You say it's like, man, it is a drug. And you know, I'm hooked on it bad. I really am. I love it. I, I've met some great people like uh Mr. You and Mr. You. <laughs> Mr. Someone, right? Yeah. Um, no, it is, you know, the what I enjoy about it the most is is what I learned from everybody else. Mm-hmm. Like that is really the coolest thing because you know, you know what you know based on where you work and, and what experiences maybe you have there. But when you're out and you're you're talking to so many people um, and you're just listening and they say, hey, this is how we do it where I come from. Man, I've I've learned some stuff that I probably would not have had it not been mm-hmm. for that experience. And, and that's what I take back to. And that's what I tell everybody, you know, when they're like, oh, you know, you're just going to teach for money or whatever. It actually has zero to do with money <laughs> at all. I right. I enjoy it because one. I get to go places I probably wouldn't go otherwise, but two, while I'm there, hundred percent a student, I get to sit in classes that I've been wanting to sit in for years. Or, you know, like I said, you get to pick the brains of students who do things a little differently than you do based off where they come from. And you take that all back. Right. And uh, Mm -hmm. to me, it just makes you a better firefighter. It does. And I think that's, I'm almost to the point now that I think it's a responsibility we all must have. Right. Like if, I forget. And I got to apologize. Who said this not too long ago? But one of the ways they, when they go to teach somewhere, they start by asking the students what they have in their pockets. What do you carry in your gear? And with the idea of just kind of let everybody get to, you know comfortable and know each other and talk about something that you know they know a lot about. And then he's, you know, they told me, you know, I learned stuff. And then I talked to them. They learned stuff. Uh, maybe it was Devin Craig. It might have been Devin Craig. I think it was anyway, uh, but it's a great icebreaker and it's that whole peer to peer, not instructor or student, you know, cause that, that thing right there, that that's like, puts you up on a pedestal and that's not really what we're there to do. We're to share knowledge. Like we're sitting at a coffee table at the firehouse. So that peer to peer thing is great. And I love what he said. He said, yeah, I just, you know, ask him what do you carry in your pockets? You know, that's how they start everything off. I thought that was pretty awesome. Yeah. There's what about always you all? Some... Do y'all have any icebreakers that you all do? You know, honestly, man, I like, I, I enjoy just, Kind of just going around and asking people where they're from, you know, kind of getting an idea of the, the crowd a little bit. Because, you know, especially when you're going to a conference, you don't know. If you're going to, like, a fire department, you can get, like, a roster and see, like, captains, lieutenants, chiefs, you know, who's going to be there. Um, you kind of ask some of the training chief or whatever, like, you know, what they got coming in. But you go to a conference, you don't know. You don't know if it's right. going to be a guy that just started a week ago or a guy that's got 30 years on the job. You don't know who's sitting in the crowd. So, to me, I, I always enjoy just kind of going around, hey, where's everybody from? different states different places hey who's you know career you know uh been on the job five years or less been on the job you know five to ten years kind of get a an idea and, and i think like that what that does is gets people talking about their backgrounds and in and, and where they're from and and most guys are pretty proud to share like hey i'm a, I'm a firefighter with this department or whatever and it's 
I think it's one of those things, man, that when you throw that out there and you just kind of start the small talk, especially before the class. Like, I love, like, going around shaking people's hands before class, talking, mm-hmm. just kind of, you know, mingling, just just asking questions, seeing what, what they're about and what they're hoping to get from the class. And uh, to me, that's it's not really an icebreaker in the sense of, uh, you know, I don't have, like, a, a, a script or anything I do or a certain thing that I go to, but just that small talk before the class starts. And then when we first start, like, raise, you know, raise your hand if you've been, five years or less or five to 10 years and all that stuff and just kind of get an idea, you know, ask people where they're from, you know, that gets people talking a little bit. It kind of gets people uh, simulated to your, your talking style and who you are. And mm-hmm. um, I, my second slide in my, every program I do is just a little, you know, bio, my family and my, my wife, my kids, you know, where I came from that way they can know my background a little bit. And then by sharing that for a few minutes, I think that, that opens things up. We're like, Hey, okay. This dude's, you know, he's, he's just talking to us like another fireman. He's just, shooting the shit uh yeah. you know having a good time and and i think like that helps people kind of ease the tensions a little bit so you know you go into a, a class that you don't know somebody and they don't know you there's an awkward moment of like you know what's this guy about is how's he going to talk to us and then when you're kind of just shooting the shit beforehand shaking hands and high five and stuff like that they're like oh okay this guy's cool and it just yeah. it just takes the, the the you know the guard down a little bit and people be become a little bit more open to hearing what you guys say because you took the time to be personal with them you took the time to get to know them a little bit and ask them where they're from and what they're about and you know that's that's you know that's the thing too man you got guys in the class that are real talkative you always have a few that that Mm -hmm. throw stuff out there especially man if they got some good stuff they're throwing out there i have zero problems like hey man that's a good that's a good point and and bridge off that and let them you know get that give them some kudos like hey that's well you know great question or great you know great uh comment because those are the things that uh people you know, people remember how you treat them and you make them feel if you if you talk down to people yeah i'll take it another class you listen to anything you have to say the minute you like talk down to somebody like you know have all the answers and you know everything what are they gonna do they're gonna shut down they're gonna be like hey this guy's an idiot like i'm not gonna listen to this guy so i don't know man i to me i think like just the small talk is is huge it's it's you know spending 20 minutes before class while you're because I, I see this all the time like some instructors are like super in the zone and mm-hmm. they go in and they're in their presentation and they're super quiet until class starts. I just, that's not me. I have to get out and mingle. I have to talk to people. Like I have to, you know, it helps me to, it, it eases my tensions. It helps me come down a little bit and, and not be super wound up when I start. So it sets the tone too. I mean, that's, it really does. And it's like you said, they're, they're coming in here and they may or may not know your material, but they probably don't know you. Right. So when you sit there and you just kind of shoot the shit, then they're like, okay, yeah, they're, you know, disarmed a little bit. And I got this guy's pretty cool. And they're more open to learning. And that's what we have to do is we have to different ways. We have to teach the people that come to listen to us. And we have in a short, a short amount of time, figure out the best delivery system, right? Because everybody's a little bit different. The way I teach at the fire department and my department is not at all the way I teach where I go to teach. It's two different things. I mean, have you all found that like when you teach at your department versus out other places that are a different style, different feel all the way around. Yeah, it is a different feel. Um, you know, I, I don't, I haven't really done too much teaching at, at my current department, but in the past, um, the, the feel it's weird because when you're teaching to your peers, you get nicks, like you get people that actually are engaged, but then you get sharpshooters, people that just, <laughs> their whole intent is just to sit there and try and derail you and like make it look like you don't know what you're talking about. And, you know, I, I honestly, that doesn't even bother me. That's fine. That's cool. Cause we can have a conversation because you, you were talking about icebreakers. And one of the things that I like to do, um, is just tell everybody like, Hey, listen, I'm not going to go on this lengthy bio. I'm a fireman. Just like everybody here. I fail a lot. I'm probably going to leave out of here and fail on the next call I go to. It's going to happen. We're here to have a conversation. We're here to learn together. Right. If there's something you want to talk about, let's talk about it. And, and I take that everywhere. So even in my own organization, Hey, I don't claim to have all the answers. You got a question. Cool. But if you want to sharpshoot, we can go down that route too. I'll gladly give you all the information of, of why I've come to the conclusions I've come to. Like, I'm not just saying this to say it. Right. And right. what I found with that is generally for the most part, if you can provide the context behind where you can come from and you can mm-hmm. say, Hey, here it is. I've done all the research for you. All you got to do is go read it that tends to shut a lot of that down. But on the Mm -hmm. other side, the people that are interested, they know you're not full of shit, right? That, that kind of like gets their buy-in of like, 
all right, well, maybe this guy, you know, actually knows what he's talking about. And he just read it 10 minutes before he walked out here to tell us something, you know? So, <laughs> um, honestly, I know I do a lot of lectures, <laughs> so this sounds kind of weird, but hands on to me is the, is the best, best way to, to put it, you know, where the rubber meets the road. You, yeah. you could talk about it all day, but I, I just, I just like getting dirty. I want to do it. I want to show it. Yeah. You, he know? Does. And <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, like window removals. If we're doing that in search, like I'm going to show you first and I'm going to tell you too, like, Hey, this may not work, but mm -hmm. in, the, in the event that it doesn't, I'm going to show you how to work through it too. And, and just build that confidence in other people. Cause at the end of the day, to me, that's what teaching is all about. I'm going to give you information, but I want you to be confident. I want you to be able to go back and, and know how to do these things and be comfortable because you might be asked to do it. And that's not the time to sit there and try and figure it out. No, I mean, I know that this could be a controversial statement simply because I lack the vocabulary to say correctly, but I feel like the fire ground scene is not the time to learn anything. And what I mean by that, <clears throat> not that you're not going to learn anything, but you really need to get game ready way before you, the, you know, the tone strap you got to. And to your point, you can't get on a fire ground scene and go, okay, how do I work this writ bag? You know, how do, how do I do that? Or man, I, I've never done a, you know, a one man 24. I'll, I'll try it now, I guess, you know, that's not the time to do it. And those are the people that, uh, that I get more, more frustrated with is the people that fell on the fire ground because they never trained. And then they're like, eh, I'll do it next time. I'm like, no, I mean, I don't think our job, honestly, <clears throat> another controversial statement, I don't think our job, honestly, is to go to fires. I really think our job is to train. Fires are just something that we do after we train, you know, um, because I think it's all a mindset for us. We, we need to realize that and just play these little mental tricks like I do. I'm not saying mine are right, but that's how I get around my, my job is if I look at it that training is my job and the side effect is going to fires, Okay, that, that, that puts in perspective what my day needs to look like. Unfortunately, as a training officer, very few people could share that view, right? There might be a handful that are like, we train every day, we train, we train hard. And there's those people that are like, no, we come in, we relax, you know, we just got off our second job. And, you know, I got to do bills for my second job for my landscaping gig. And, you know, I'm gonna take a little nap and then, well, I got to watch a new Tom Cruise movie. But, you know, maybe we'll tie some knots in the day room, you know? Like that's not that's not it, man. We get that's our job is to train. But I've been wrong before. I've been married twice, so that tells you right now. Good decisions aren't my best. Oh man, I make, um, I make a decision, but I may not make a good one. Hey, you know what? Sometimes half the battle is just making a decision. Trust me, I have this conversation oh, yeah. with my wife all the time. Yep, I had a <laughs> I had a, a, a old major that uh, I say old because he's retired, not because he's old like old man, but. He always said, make a decision, good or bad, make that decision. And don't be afraid to change it five minutes later. Yeah. Like, that's, that's good advice. Yeah. Conf, conf, you know, confident, make a decision, but it also humble enough to say, hey, hey, maybe we need to modify the plan a little bit. And, you know, to your point on the teaching at home versus teaching abroad, um, some of the toughest critics you'll ever face are in your own fire department. That's just anyone, anybody you talk to that, that teaches will tell you like, and you know this, Jake, I mean, Sean, um, sometimes your toughest critics and the people who are the most skeptical of you are the people in your own fire department. And, and I don't know that it's, you know, some of them just don't care. They just want to sharpshoot. And I think some of them too, you know, it's just one of those things like, Oh, you know, what's this guy doing? He's out here, you know, teaching at FDIC or doing this or doing that. And like, I think it scares people like it, it, people that aren't engaged or as engaged when you have somebody who's going above and beyond and going out there and putting themselves out there. Um, you know, it's easy for guys to think, Oh, you know, that you got, look at this guy's big, too big for his britches. He's out here doing this and that, and no, you know, writing, writing articles and doing podcasts and teaching and stuff. And it's like, they automatically associate that with like, Oh, he must think he's somebody. And, that's the furthest thing from the truth. And in 90% of the guys you run into, that's, that's not the case. It's just, they're just trying to make a difference, right? They're trying to make a difference, but it's a hard sell in, in your it. own fire department sometimes. And you know, it's that whole, uh, profits, not without honor, saving his own country thing. It's, it's that yeah. whole, um, you know, you're, you're really, when you get down to it, the definition of an expert, right? What's the definition of an expert? Someone who comes from a hundred miles away or more, right? <laughs> yeah. You get outside a hundred miles, all of a sudden you're an expert. 
Just, yeah. just, you you fly over a certain state right, and you're like all right. of a sudden you're super smart yeah yeah you, yeah you drive far enough man and it's like oh this guy you know so <laughs> i always laugh because you know people all oh, that guy's an expert like because it's a different voice i hear this all the time you go to you go to teach and, and guys like i've literally been telling my guys this for like the last three years and then you come in and say the same thing i've been saying ever we need to go do this and right. and it it's, it's amazing how that works right you know same thing in your own fire department you'd be like guys, we should, you know, we really need to try to get this piece of equipment or try to, you know, enact this tactic. It's, it's more effective or do this because it works better. And no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. And then somebody comes in from outside and they're like, all of a sudden they're all excited. Like, oh yeah, this is the greatest thing. I watched, man, I watched like probably 10, 12 years ago when uh, our department, when I was in Florida, made the, the kind of push for VES. Because at that mm -hmm. point it wasn't like in the playbook. Um, even though we did window oriented searches from time to time, it just wasn't called that. Um, but it was in the playbook and guys like, Oh no, 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 no. It's like fought it for years. I was like, come on, we should do, we, we, you know, we should be putting VES in our playbook. That needs to be a thing that we do. And all of a sudden, like somebody else comes in and teaches a class on search and they talk about VES and all of a sudden everybody's on board with the training chief and everybody's all excited. I'm like, I've literally for two years been saying we need to do this, you know? And, and it's just, but discouraged you know for guys that are, that are you know starting out teaching or putting themselves out there and trying to make their department the job better whether it's mm -hmm. writing articles whether it's teaching classes whether it's you know going to conferences uh whatever it is that you're doing you're gonna you're gonna catch uh some friendly fire um yeah. back back at home that's just the way it's gonna be and you you really just got to kind of stay focused on what your objective is and if you're really doing it because you want to make a difference and you really believe in what you're trying to, to push, whatever it is, whether it's a tool or tactic, uh, trying to get the department to train more, whatever it is. If you truly believe in what you're doing, stay the course, because at the end of the day, the right people are going to take note. And mm -hmm. you're always going to have haters. You're always going to have people throwing rocks. But at the end of the day, you're going to you're going to walk right past them. You know, you know why they're talking behind your back? Because you've already passed them like you're already you yeah. already moved past them. They're, they're behind you, man. And so yeah. don't get caught up in the in the politics and the rhetoric and you know, get all down and discouraged and, or get, get, you know, even worse, you know, and I've done this in the past, man. You used to, <laughs> I'd fly hot a couple, you know, it wasn't that long ago where I had to learn some hard lessons, man. Like, Hey, sometimes you just got to let it go. Like don't engage with those people because some people they, just want to, to, to poke the bear, man. Some people just want to get a rise. They want to argue with you. They want to, you know, basically get you riled up or, or fired up. And, and that's just the way they are. And you got to accept that and just be like, Hey, you know what? There's going to be like people like that and, and learn to, to walk past that. And, and I tell you, man, it's hard because when you give a shit, it's yes. really hard to not take things personal. It is. And they, they do not know from our perspective what we're doing. Right. So I think Sean said something about money earlier, right? We don't make a ton of money. And most people that I've talked to that travel and teach, they make enough to cover uh, on the average. It's been uh, overtime. You know, if I missed overtime teaching, it's about the same amount of money. Uh, for me, uh, I don't make a ton of money. I got to use all my own PTO. So it's kind of a wash money wise, but that never factors in to anybody that I've talked to you and, and Sean as well. Um, but, the, but people that these sharpshooters, these people that want to see you fail from your own department, I feel like is they don't understand what we're doing. Um, every single person I've talked to on the podcast, I mean, honestly, almost every single one, and you all know this, uh, you've been on it. Uh, what do you, which one? Good point, three point firefighter. Um, see a little plug there, hope you like that. But with failure, like everything that the, all our failures have kind of shaped our career. And we don't do what we do because we think we're better than anybody else. It's that we feel an obligation that the fire service has been so good to us, we have to return it. So we try to put our thoughts down in articles. Uh, we try to submit classes or take classes, you know, be part of teaching a class. We do all these things because we want to be, uh, we want to pay back the fire service because the fire service doesn't owe you a thing. We owe the fire service everything. And it's not for everybody to stand up in front of a bunch of people. I get that. I, I was terrified of it at first, but I mean, it's our obligation. You know, we love the fire service. We know what it gave us and we know what our responsibility is. It's not... I always say the responsibility, our responsibility isn't anyone in the firehouse. It's everybody outside the firehouse. And if you do that right, everybody in the firehouse is taken care of as well. So, yeah, I, yeah, I deal with that, too. I've had people uh, in classes that I teach at my department question me on stuff that on the side, I've had 
conversations with them where I know what they're thinking because, you know, but they're like just trying to trip me up. And sometimes I'll even tell them, look, you know, I'm not an expert in this. If you're looking to mess with me or, or find something that I don't know, that's easy, bro. I'll lead you down a pass and go ahead and get over it. You just get it done with, right? I'm terrible with building construction. Let's pick on me about that. <laughs> Let me fail now and then I'll go on with the class. But I still, yeah, I still have people that uh, I don't think they understand my passion for the job and the obligation that I feel to share that. No, and it is an obligation. And, and you know, I don't think people understand just how much you take on in that process, right? Mm -hmm. How much things go through your, your mind because you care. Like you said, you're passionate. You give a shit. You, you want the message to be delivered the correct way. So there's a lot of time, sleepless nights, you know, just research after research, just making sure that like you're digging in and like, Hey, you know, it's just as much as proving my theories wrong as it is proving them right. right. You know what I'm saying? So like, I knew what I knew back then and I know what I know today and I and have somehow bridged the gap. And that only happens one way by exposing yourself, really, mm -hmm. you know, like getting out there and saying, Hey, I need to know more about this. And what I tell people when it comes to training is, Hey, today's training is tomorrow's victory, right? If we could get this over with now, we're going to be better way down the line. And if we can think about training as in the future, right? Mm -hmm. We think about everything else. We think about our pensions, right? our bank accounts, savings, like all that stuff, all that's for future, right? Or in right. case of emergency, our job's no different. We have to invest. We have mm -hmm. to invest, right? So we train the way we do today so that we can outperform others who won't in the future. That is just, that's the fact, right? So right. I think if we can get that message across to people that they would understand, like we're coming from a place because we care. I don't want to see you get hurt. I don't want to, I don't want to have to bury you. I want you to go home to your wife and kids or your husband and kids, whatever your situation is. And I want to do that too. So if we can work together, right. And have that information exchange and just every day, try and be a little bit better. That's brotherhood. That's sisterhood. That's what all of that is. Right. Yep. It has nothing to do with ego. Mm -mm. No, but you know, what's funny you say that <clears throat> I have been struggling with ego for it's been like stuck in my brain, like the front of my brain for like six months. Decisions that I make and things that I do that are ego based, either my thoughts on somebody or what I think their thoughts of me. So I'm starting to put that in my head. I'm actually working on a sticker that you put on a water bottle, you know, your little water bottle you take with you to, to push your put your thumb on it when you're getting that way to take that ego away from you. Cause I've always said, if you could have a button on the outside of the fire department, when you go into the firehouse uh, for your shift and you put your thumb there and it took out your ego for 24 hours, man, it, it'd be nothing but teamwork and, and caring about the community, doing everything you can proactive, everything, you know, but it's our ego. And as people that teach, you know, we know those people that sharpshooter people, they feel uh, the ones that I've had honest conversations with, feel like from their perspective that I come off like I, I know everything and I don't, I might know a few things here and there, but I don't know everything. So when they come to that room, their ego is just inflamed, right? Who's this guy to tell me that, you know, about, Oh, I've been on a truck for, you know, 20 years. I know all about search and rescue. You know, he's never been on a truck in 10 years. So that's an ego thing for them. So I got to keep their ego in check sort of by the way I communicate with them. Right. I know where they're coming from. And I need to kind of get around that, which means probably a few more qualifiers and probably pulling them more into the conversation. So something like, you know, I, I know I've been on the truck in, a, in, in quite a while, uh, but you have, you know, Larry, you have. Uh, so what are your thoughts on this? And that kind of diffuse the situation a little bit. But yeah, ego, man, that is that is, I think, right now, one of the biggest killers of us, because it's so easy to see, be mad at somebody else that has something, whether I want it or not mad that somebody got promoted, even though I didn't want the promotion, you know, or somebody mad at me because I took a training officer spot, even though they didn't want it. So it's something we got to, I think we really got to work on. So. Um, yeah. You can't feed the ego dog, man. You, you know, whether it's ours or theirs. And, and the thing is like, if you throw the, the scraps to the, to the ego hounds, man, like it's, <laughs> you can, you can guarantee they're going to take more than scraps. Like it's, it's going to come back on you as an instructor uh, you know, if you start engaging in, in a, in a, you have to diffuse, you have to kind of, and I like what you said there about kind of bringing them into 
the conversation and, and kind of putting it back in there, you know, like, Hey, you, you got all this experience and stuff. Uh, share, share your thoughts with us, share your, you know, experiences with us. And you know, a lot of people, when you put them on the spot like that, all of a sudden it's like, Whoa, wait, wait, well, I'm not teaching this class, man. Like, you know, and some guys will, <laughs> you know, you gotta be careful. Some guys will try to hijack and, but, but a lot of guys also, when you start putting them on the corner and like asking them questions and throwing right. it back on them, they, they realize like, okay, hey, we're on the same team here. Let's, let's work together. And, and, Getting you know that senior guy on board is yeah. huge. If you can find that guy that's kind of that that leader in the crowd and kind of like getting with them even even before class, like I said, you know, talking to him like, hey, you know, hey, this guy's thirty some years, you know, veteran truck captain, blah blah blah, you know, and really really solid guy that everybody respects. Man, if you get that guy and start picking his brain a little bit and kind of show him that, hey, I don't have all this. I'm just trying to show you what a little bit you know the stuff that I do know. But if you have things to add, man, please do. Um, and what that does is that, you know, helps them feel like, okay, this guy's not coming in trying to tell me, you know, I got 30 years on the job and here's this guy coming in and telling me what I'm doing wrong. No, it's like, Hey, what, what can we do better? That's, I think that's the better way to look at it is what can we do better? What can we improve on? Are there things that we're doing now that could be better and how do we get there? And, and I think right. like, that's the thing too, is when, if you come in trying to change things, you know, and that's the, the way you approach it. Uh, you're probably going to have a lot more speed bumps um, because <laughs> yeah. firemen, like most people in general, especially firemen, are very resistant to change. You know, very resistant to someone coming in and saying you're doing it wrong. Right. That's yeah. why you got, you got to really. And there's very few things that that we teach that doesn't have a million different ways to do it. Right. Um, so I, I try as hard as I can to remember the phrase. You know, there's more than one way to do this. I'm just going to show you a way. Because I have made that mistake in the past where I, I start a class off and they're like, well, no, no, I've always done it this way and that way, you know, and I'm like, I kind of box myself into a corner where I have to defend my position as opposed to saying, no, no, like I mentioned earlier, there's a bunch of different ways. Hey, how about you show us your way? And there's some things I don't teach and I, I will just always, you know, healing the ladder from underneath. I'll never teach that ever as you know, that's not a good, good practice. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. <laughs> there's some things like that. I don't, I don't give ground on, but I think almost everything else, you know, um, whenever we do writ drills, uh, people get all, and everybody learns all these, uh, fancy ways to use their webbing and tie these special knots on a down firefighter. And I'm like, just grab them, just go, you know, there's other options, you know, and it, it gets kind of, it gets kind of hard sometimes when you see some of the decisions made by people and you want to say, eh, don't do that, but you have to kind of encourage their, their freedom a little bit, you know, their creative thinking. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's some of those things that you just have to, you have to stand ground on, and, you know, fog streams to tack a fire. That might be one of them breaking every window uh, to ventilate, get those damn hot gases out, you know, so everybody can see for two seconds. Yeah. There's some of those things I don't bend on, but there's some things I try to say, yeah, you know, there's a bunch of different ways to do this. So. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think that's the most important thing. You know, like even when I teach, I primarily teach search stuff, but I tell people straight from the beginning, listen, I'm not here to change your policies and procedures. I'm not here to tell you you're doing it wrong. That's not what we're here to do. I'm just here to have a conversation. I'm going to present you with some information. I'm going to tell you about some experiences that I've had, what I've learned from them and why I've changed and what I've learned along the way. And I'm going to give it to you. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, that's okay too, right? And one of the things that I like to do is bring them in is, hey, who here has actually physically put their hand on someone when it when they came to search? And they raised their hand, you know, tell me about that. Was it hard? Was it easy? And I let them tell the story. You kind of bring everybody in, you know, now everybody's listening. And that just kind of helps solidify the point so that when you go outside and you say, okay, we're going to do removals. Hey, show me how you remove that victim. I know you told us in class that you did one. Let me see how you did it. Cool. Mm -hmm. Hey, let me show you something that's going to make your life a lot easier. Should you do this next time? You tell me what you think, right? It's mm -hmm. it's that respect that you're giving them that I know that I'm here to to to, to teach supposedly, right? I, I hate that word, but I know I'm here to to do what I'm supposed to do, but you're as part of this as I am, right? And I want you to know that I don't know everything and this is my way and this is why I choose mm -hmm. to do it. And then you make the decision for yourself. Ultimately, we're not going to be on the fire with these people. Right? We're not going right. to be there. So they're going to have to make these decisions on their own. And the only thing right. we can do is better prepare them and hope that when the time comes, they make an appropriate one. That's all we can do. And you touched on it earlier too. We learn 
part of that drug addiction of teaching, especially travel teaching, uh, is that we learn as almost as much as we share, right? So I can't tell you how many cool things I've learned that I thought I had a really good handle on. I thought I kind of I, I feel like there's certain classes that if somebody said, "All right, teach me class right now on this subject," I feel like I could do pretty good. Uh, and then I go and I see how somebody else does it. I'm like, I never thought of that. That was amazing. Right. Um, I, I was in Olathe, Kansas, teaching uh, NFPA 1700 with like five of the best instructors ever. And one of them was uh, from Olathe named Captain Ryan Trader. And then so he was doing uh, VES. And right next to his station was um, Cameron Sunderland from Altoona, Pennsylvania. And he was teaching uh, forcible entry. And so I was the lead. So I kind of had to walk around, make sure nobody need anything or be extra hands. And I kept coming around to those two stations. And I was like, I, I, I've taught both of those, both of those things a bunch. And I just sat there and I learned so much. I was a sponge. I was like, I never knew that, man. I had no, the way you did that, that's so simple. I, why did I never think of that? You know, just the <laughs> simplest damn things. So yeah, it's very humbling, but uh, that's part of that addiction is learning. You know, if you're going to be a, a fire instructor, you've got to crave knowledge. You really do. I mean, you can't not. I mean, that's, that's the whole essence of what we do is we want to, just ingest as much knowledge as we can so we can run and share it, you know, just kind of pass that on. But it, I love it. I love it. I think, you know, really watching the light come on for somebody like that aha moment um, mm -hmm. is, is really cool. It's a, it's a really cool thing to watch when somebody comes in and, you know, um, and, and, and you kind of hit on it too. When, when guys come in that do have time on, and they have that aha moment, like 20 years on the job, and they're like, oh, man, I just like, never really saw it from this angle before, right? And it's nothing new to them. They're, they're familiar with the topic, but you get in there and you show them a little nugget that somebody you know, somebody showed you or something you learned the hard way or on a job that you went to. And, and that's the beauty of, of you know, teaching and going to conferences and, and taking classes and, and doing all this stuff is you're constantly – in this this information cycle right you're constantly this in this feedback loop of you know i go to um, right now i'm at, at a conference at revolutionary tactics by the lake and and you know it's awesome we'll go sit around the pool in a little bit and have a beer and yeah share stories with guys from all over the country and and guys you know hey i had this ves and this is what happened or you know hey i started carrying my gear this way because of xyz or whatever and then just bouncing things back and forth and we'll we'll talk you know hose and nozzles and all this stuff and like <laughs> it's wild man because it's like it's nothing new it's been around but you just right. get these little nuggets and every every once in a while someone will say something that'll do, you know I, I find this like every everywhere i go i always come away with one or two nuggets of, of things that i'm like man you know that just clicked with me right it just made more sense or hey you know what i've been doing it this way and this works but guess what that actually works a little bit better or hey mm -hmm. there's a little bit you know this this little tidbit of information really helps drive this point home better and and it's amazing man everywhere you i go i, I feel like i learn as much from the students sometimes i swear i, I walk away like who taught the class because like yeah. we're sharing information during breaks you know it's like hey what do you guys do what kind of hose are you guys running what are you guys running into in your first do and and i'm you know you're making those mental notes and i go home and i got you know my little notepad thing full of notes of just stuff that i write down periodically as i'm going because it's like you know, you're old, the the presentations that I do constantly are changing or being honed and refined. And yeah. and you do something, you go somewhere else and you're like, oh, you pick this up, you pick that up. You realize, hey, this works better. Let's get rid of this, add this. And Sean and I talk about this all the time where it's guys like, why are you looking over your presentation? You're like, you've done it like 20 times because I'm always finding little tidbits of pieces of information that that need refining, that need to be, you know, vetted, that need to be like, hey, I, I go to a job and I, I go, hey, you know what? Yeah, I could probably explain this better. And and here's how. Put it in context and like, oh, this this is why it's this way or whatever. And 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 it's just you don't stop learning. And I think that's the beauty of it, is you yeah. just you're always in this this feedback loop of sharing information, giving information. You're really as an instructor, when you get down to it, uh, you know, you're facilitating learning. That's what you're doing. You're facilitating, mm -hmm. you're you're trying to make an environment where people aren't afraid to ask questions, where people aren't afraid to fail, where people are not afraid to try in front of their peers, right? You're trying to create this environment where it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to to you know have to try uh, you know four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times to to get the result that you want. And that's okay. 
And Mm -hmm. it's okay to challenge the status quo. And I think that's the beauty. If you have a good training culture, whether you're teaching in a conference or whether you're a training officer, uh, you're a fireman, you know, officer in your firehouse, uh, make it where people feel comfortable asking questions. You know, is it okay to challenge the status quo? Hey, you know what? I don't know that that'll work, but let's give it a whirl. Or sometimes you just let them, you let them do it. Just so you can, they, they understand why you say what you're saying, you know, yes. why you run a certain hose load, why you, you know, bought the ladder a certain way, why, you know, let them, let them do it a few times and realize, oh, okay, now I see what you're saying. And when they can put it in context, man, that's when the light comes on. That's when the aha moment, I had a, I had a 25 year captain uh, a couple classes ago, I was doing come up to me and he was like, man, you know, uh, I teach this in my fire department, you know, and with my guys and we talk about this all the time. And, and, you know, he's like, I don't know why, but the way you said it just made more sense to me. And he's like, I'm going to use that. I'm going to go back, you know, show him, show him this information. And, and I was like, man, I didn't invent this. (laughs) Like really at the end of the day, like I learned it from somebody else, right? I learned it from somebody who taught me. And that's what makes the job better is when guys are, there's a free flow of information, check the egos at the door. Information Mm -hmm. can go in and out, up and down, it doesn't matter. And and people aren't afraid to question the why. They're not afraid to 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 bounce things around and try things and figure out what works best. That's that's when a fire department is at its best. That's when a firefighter is at their best. That's when they're gonna learn the most, is when that kind of environment exists. And that's what we're trying to do, right? As instructors, I, I'll leave it at that is is you know, I get off my soapbox, but we are not I there love to, it, man. To, I love it. <laughs> to, to tell you what you're doing wrong. I'm just here to show you some things that may enhance your job and make it better. Right. Absolutely. That's, that's the nail of the head. We're not there to tell you what you're doing wrong. You know, we're, we're there to have a dialogue, try to learn together. Um, one of the things you, you just <clears throat> reminded me of something I took a many, many years ago, I took a, at my department, a, a rope, <clears throat> ropes op ropes tech class. And they kind of had them pretty close back to back. And I took them and I did okay passing everything. But about two months later, I think around that time frame, I couldn't remember what the fuck I was doing. I couldn't t- set up a system to save my life. So I got it in my head. I'm like, okay, I got to do this. I was down at uh, station three, which is uh, headquarters. Right. And then that was where the, we were uh, quartered with the truck, truck one, and they had all the equipment. So I'm like, it's very realistic. I'll be tasked to do this. So I would go on, uh, you know, by myself in the Bay after, you know, four or five o'clock right before dinner or the weekends. And I would take out all the rope stuff. And I had a, a nice book that had notes And I would set these systems up myself, by myself on the ground. And then I would pull and it worked or it didn't work. Well, I had this captain who was fantastic and he was, he's a rope guru. I mean, the rope guru, I think he invented, he's pretty old. So he probably did invent ropes, but he was just a great, great mentor and all that. He would come out in his typical, I want to help you uh, thing. And he'd go, I'd be putting it together and he'd go, no, 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 you can't put that there. And, you know, he was always right. So I'd switch it and kind of aggravate me because I wanted it to either work or not work because the way I learn is I have to see it fail. He's never wrong. And I mean that in a good way. He know he knows it. So finally, I just said, Captain, I said, you know, I appreciate your help. You're the best. You know, I listen to anything you say, but I would rather fail because that's my, my best way of learning. And he'd go, it's like a light went off on him. He goes, oh, okay. I never thought of that. Okay. Yeah. So he goes, do you care if I watch? I'm like, no, it's no problem. So he would sit out there. I would, you could see him every now and then I do stuff. He goes like that, <laughs> but I would, it wouldn't work. And then if I couldn't figure it out, then I had an instant answer right there. I'm like, all right, Cap, what I do wrong? Okay, well, you see where you got your presser? So that that took me right back to that that moment when he said that. But that's, as instructors, you got to think about how people learn. Sometimes it's not PowerPoints. Sometimes it's not putting a hose in their hand or a line in their hand in front of a bunch of people, you know? It just depends. And and we have to kind of figure that out. But um, yeah, you can't be afraid to fail. And I I think going back to ego, that's probably our biggest problem when we train together. Uh, We we create our own problems in the sense, if somebody screws up in training, what do we always do? Not instructors, but, you know, for the firefighters, we bust balls. So we kind of make that environment ourselves. So people don't want to go first and they don't want to fail. So they kind of stay, hang back or, or do half-ass something basically, or make a huge joke of it, you know? So when they fail, they're like, ah, no big deal. So yeah, we got to cultivate these environments. So it's okay to fail. And I'm blessed. I got a couple of guys I work with that know this are really great instructors and they'll go first and screw up semi on purpose just to go, oh man, you know, and it kind of just calms everybody down. So 
uh, have a HR lady that helps us. She's crazy for the fire department. She loves us to death. She does everything she can to help us. And she has this thing. We put together this class and we have this thing uh, called staging. So if you have an idea that is not on topic of what we're talking about, we park it in staging. So we go over here and we write it. So what she does is she'll tell you to purposely misspell it with the, so to make you comfortable because people are nervous to, to write in front of everybody because they're afraid to misspell something. So she will tell you to misspell something on purpose. So nobody cares to go up there and, and write. So, I, I mean, it kind of goes right along with that. You know, she's just making it easy for all the students, uh, you know, and, and just, just try to make everybody comfortable. I love that idea. I'm going to steal that idea and not give her any credit for it. So you're going to have to cut this part out of the podcast. Consider it edited. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's all right. People do it all the time. It's no big deal. <laughs> That's mine now. Right. Yeah. That's mine. <laughs> um, I own it. I, this conversation is, is awesome. It's probably one of my favorite things to talk about. As, as both of you guys know, like, we could sit here and talk about this thing probably for two or three days easily. You know, so the thing, the message that I just, I personally like to send to people is how much do you love this job? And I like to hear what they think. Some people are like, eh, it's a job. Some people are like, man, I really, really love it. Okay. How much do you know about this job? Do you still want this job 20 years from now? You know, and the reason I ask those questions is you want to just, you want to destroy the fire service, get people to stop learning about it period, whatever that is, get people mm -hmm. to stop learning. You will destroy our profession in a heartbeat. Right. And I think like you, Jake, I never wanted to be an instructor. I never mm -hmm. did. It was not something I aspired to do, but something happened where I was like, you know what? I, I don't know enough. Right. And it almost cost me my life. And I was like, wow, never again, never again. I don't want that for me. I don't want that for anybody else. And it really boiled down to I wasn't around an environment where people cared about the fire service. They didn't care about training. They didn't care about learning. And and as I got further on in my career, that's what I've learned. You know, we have people that that could care less. They clock in, they clock out, and that's that's all they think about it. And they handle the call as it comes in. And I've just seen so many things go south in the fire department. And I've come to that conclusion. You want to destroy this great profession? Stop learning. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll even add to that. What I can't stand is anybody, especially officers, bad mouthing training. I can't stand it. There's just, I, there's no room for it. Uh, I, I, and I know that I've done it. So let me go ahead and throw that disclaimer out. A, a, every, every bad thing I bring up that I dislike, pro, I've done it. And, and I guess it's my penance now not to do it anymore and share, you know, what, what I know. But it's I cannot stand it because all it takes is one captain on one crew to say that training officer doesn't know what he talks about or I will never do it that way or I nozzle forward. What's that? No, no. You just you just you just crawl around that way. You limit your head movement. That's a good thing. It saves your back. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know that it just takes one of those people to just ruin, absolutely ruin your training culture. I used to think it was the training officer that makes the training culture in your department. That's not it, man. It's it's the company officer. It just is. It just is. And I, I hate that. And I, I love the fire service. It's, to me, it's it's like it's like a wife. It's like a family, right? The whole thing is, is you take care of it. Like you would never do things to your family you do at the fire department, right? I, you wouldn't talk shit about your wife. You wouldn't go up to your kids and go, what about mom? Her dinner sucked. She's so bad at that. She's the worst cook in the world, right? And then you wouldn't go to your son and go, what about... Hey, what about your sister, man? Her room. That's God, she's garbage. It's like a dump in there, right? We would never do that. We know better. It never comes across our mind. We would never want to hurt people that that we care about. But we'll go to the firehouse, ooh, doggies, and, and just just cut brothers and sisters down, you know. And when officers do it, and when it's something vital like training, you know, it just, it just you could have all the the good, the goodwill in the world, but if if that captain has has tainted your students or your your brothers and sisters that are trying to learn man you're you're just wasting your time up there you really are that just oh that drives me nuts i just the, we owe the fire service so much and these guys are ruining it and don't care about it don't care mm -hmm. about it they just they i what drives me nuts and again i did this is oh they wait they don't make any runs or really do anything so the next day when they're leaving shift they go oh, i stole that money i'm like dude you know we're here to, <laughs> I think you got it wrong, man. I mean, 
Jeez. No. Yeah, no, you, you're, dude. Let me let me just you know, kind of summarize uh, the last forty five minutes in, in this. It really it comes down to this, and I think our brother Tony Anthony uh, Gillen. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Anthony down there, uh, Marion County. I know Sean is very familiar oh with Tony. With Tony, um, but uh, I was listening to him talk on uh, Prepared to Fight Fire just the other day, and he kind of was talking about the brotherhood and essentially, uh, you know. It really is. I mean, it's one of those things where you you get out of it what you put into it, right? And and talking about how that people, you know, complain about you know brotherhood is dead, this that and the other, and uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially it's you know you you kind of you give everything and expect nothing is the, the way you put it, right? And and right. it's one of those things where you're making deposits, you're making deposits in your fire department, into the fire service, and you're doing that through consistency, going into work, giving a shit about the job checking your rigs, cleaning your equipment, training hard, PT, going to conferences, being a student in the craft, right? That's a fireman. That's the difference between being a, a fireman and an employee, right? Um, right. And, that, and he was talking about that. And, and his whole thing in that in that podcast was basically, you know, one day everybody's going to come, come to a point in their life where they're going to need to need to make a withdrawal, if you will. You're making deposits and, and you're going to need the brotherhood. You're going to need those guys to be there for you. And if you've never put nothing in, right, if you're just a taker, then don't be surprised if it's, you know, you're kind of, I hate to say this, but kind of out on your own when stuff goes sideways because you shit, you shit all over guys for 20 years. And then, you know, you get three people show up at your retirement party. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's kind of the, the, the gist of the conversation. Again, I'm paraphrasing because uh, I'm terrible at quotes unless I write them down. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you know, he's, he's spot on. And, and Tony's been through a lot over the last year. And he's been through a shit ton over the course of his career. Um, but but hearing him say that, man, it just really stuck with me. It was like, hey, that's why we do what we do, right? That's why we we try to share as much information as we can. That's why we try to to pass it on. And, and you know, whether it's podcasts or classes or whatever you're doing in your own firehouse, you know, sharing information with the new guy that just got him on your crew or, or, you know, going out and training on stuff, cleaning the rig, right? All those little things, that's our job, like training, preparedness is 90% of our job is preparedness. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Like that is what we do. Um, and you, and you hit on that earlier, right? That's really what we get paid for is preparedness. Um, sure. but at the end of the day, like those are deposits that when, when like Sean was talking about when it matters one day, when shit hits the fan and your life is in the balance or your brothers or sisters lives are in the balance. Like that's when it's time to, you know, you hope that you made enough deposit in your training in your preparedness and taking care of your brothers and looking out for them that that, that it's going to come back and 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 hopefully you know when you need to make that withdrawal it's all there you know what i'm saying and, and you're not on the on the, the short end of that stick so to speak and out in the cold or worse god forbid dead or, or you know off the job injured whatever um that's why we train that's why we do the things we do and that's why we push so hard and and some people get upset you know they get like listen i get it it makes people uncomfortable when when you're pushing for change when you're pushing for being better and being accountable like that is uncomfortable sometimes and you know, i'm not abusive because lord knows i i've been there where you get so passionate that you almost you come across abrasive right yes but what I, it, on, the, on the flip side you don't apologize for being passionate about the job don't apologize for giving a damn you know i got guys make fun of me for for always every every shift i, I check my scba out i put my mask on i do a mask up drill and I breathe down mm -hmm. the cylinder, right? And I check, you know, dude, we, you don't got to do that. We did it yesterday. I don't care. I'm going to do it every day <laughs> because that's my lifeline, right? And, you know, you get guys make little comments about, oh, you know, got your own personal tool on the truck. I see, you know, stuff like that. You know, they, they poke fun of you for having your own tools or, you know, oh, uh, going to another conference again, huh? You're, you know, wish I was a real nerd like that. You know, get stuff like that all the time, you know, thrown out there. And it's like, you know what? Who cares? Who cares? Yep. At the end of the day, like you're what they don't realize is you're doing what you're doing for them yeah. and for their family. And, and if they're not doing their job, you have you have no choice but to, to kick yours into high gear because when you got one person that doesn't know how to move hose or doesn't know about proper ventilation and and, 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 and water mapping, they don't know that stuff, then it's on you. So you have to up your game. And even though you up your game, it's it's still a diluted pool. If, if you had three people on an engine that were just in sync, they were just, they went to the same conferences, they did the same training, they understand all that stuff. Dude, that would, it'd be the best job in the world. 
but you could be, you could move hoes like a champion. You could understand all the UL studies. And if you get that one guy that doesn't work out, he's a hundred pounds overweight, doesn't give a shit about the job, doesn't know anything on the truck. I don't care how good you are. You're diluted. You can, you gotta, you gotta try harder, which means more energy, which means you can put yourself in, in a worse position. But these people don't realize because the ego, you know, they don't care. They really don't care. They base all their success on lack of failure. You know, uh, all those fires went out, you know, that I, every fire I've been at, uh, that, that they've gone out. I'm like, jack wagon, they go out anyway, even if we don't show up. OK, the, the idea is not to put the fire out. The idea is to put it out extremely efficient. So we give put time on the clock for our victims. That's what we're doing. We're not just trying to go through. Uh, I recently had people tell me uh, doing some live fire that, you know, why, why are we doing this? We know how to put put out fire. I'm like, yeah, everybody knows I put out fire. Everybody knows I put out fire. But can you can you do it efficiently? Can you can you do it and put time on the clock for those victims? That's what we're doing. It's it's aggravating. Um, but one of the things that drives me nuts, and this one goes, this is just like nails on the chalkboard to me. Uh, is when people say, and I hear officers say it all the time, man, I do anything for my guys. My guys are going home tomorrow. I promise you, I don't care what comes, they're going to go home tomorrow. And then I'll just like, let me see how you're training for the past month. Huh, okay, cool. Uh, you guys work out? Nope. All right. Uh, let's see. You, you, your, your truck's dirt. I mean, come on. Don't don't tell me you do anything for your guys and you make sure they're going to go home. Don't don't beat that chest bullshit. Don't do it. Be honest with me and say, I'm going to do everything for my guys up to the point that it gets kind of uncomfortable for me or I get tired. Or I just don't feel like doing it. Be that guy. Be honest, because I, I cannot stand when you you use your crew as a pawn to boast for yourself. I do anything for my guys. I make sure they go home every day. But you haven't been in a bad position. And if you're not training every day, if you're not staying on your gas, do the little things to wear the uniform right, to check out the truck, to check their SCBA out. Uh, if you're not doing that, then you're not doing everything. It, I'm, I'm really big on wearing your SCBA and overhaul. That To me, that's one of the biggest things ever. And I'm pushing so hard right now for that. And don't tell me you care about your people if you don't do these, these small things. All right. I mean, it, it goes all through me because – you're just using your crew to make yourself look good. And it's that ego again, right? That's this whole thing. It's been in my brain for a while. And this is ego thing. And you just want people to think you're the best at your job. You're the best officer. You don't have to be, man. Just be honest. Just be honest and train. Uh, and you know, what we, you know, what we fight in, our, in the fire service. We fight the Dunning Kruger effect, right? We, we fight that the people that know just enough to get them in trouble that are way yep. overconfident. Until you know, and, and unfortunately, what it takes a lot of times is a, something going sideways for them to be humbled, and it, it yep. sucks. It sucks that that's the way it is. Um, I can tell you, man. Like I've had a couple humbling experiences in my in my career that you know you think you got a grasp on something, and then you get knocked down a couple of pegs. And like holy shit, I don't know as much as I thought, and and it kind of puts it into you know it puts it into context. Like holy cow, like you know here I was thinking I was la di da, I got this all figured out, and then I got stumped or I got put in a situation that kicked me in the nuts and made me realize like, damn, like I was not ready for that. And you know, it, it's sad, but with a lot of type A personalities in this job, sometimes that's what it takes. And you hope yeah. and you plead and you plead with guys and you're fighting that, that, like I said, that Dunning Kruger the thing is very real where you have people that know just enough, you know, from the Academy or what their, you know, captain 20 years ago told them <laughs> they do just enough. They've been to just enough fires where they kind of have an idea, but they, you know, all the dots aren't connected. It's just kind of one of those half pictures where it's a swan. No, dude, it's, it's, it's literally a folded up piece of paper. <laughs> um, but you know what I'm saying? Like, that's what we're fighting, you know, in the fire service right now is, is there's a lot of, a lot of not knowing what you don't know kind of thing. It's, there's a right. lot of that out there. And, and that's where I think like, it, you know, it's up to us to, you know, you gotta, and, and really I'm, I'm preaching to myself here is just being patient and realizing like, like you said earlier, Jake, um, it doesn't matter how good of a fireman you are. If you don't bring everybody up on team, yeah, it's team sport. You can't do it all on your own. And so ultimately it doesn't matter. You can have the best basketball player in the world on the shittiest team and they're going to lose every game. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because that individual doesn't make the team. And I think like, that's what we got to keep in mind as, as, as instructors, as firefighters, officers, whatever we're, you know, the goal should be to lift, you know, to, to raise the bar collectively. You, you mm -hmm. still have your bar set way up here. 
but the ultimate goal is to bring everybody up. And and sometimes that means coming down to where they're at. And I had this conversation with John Spera a couple months ago about, you know, getting guys to work out, right? And if you got a guy that's like super shredded, like, you know, way up here with his fitness, and you get this guy who's 100 pounds overweight that, you know, knows he should be working out, and you go in the gym and try to get him to keep up with a guy like John, he's not keeping up. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. and he's going to feel like shit. He's probably going to quit. And like John was saying, you know, when we we're talking, he was like, look, you got to, hey, just start small, man. Like scale the workouts. Like if you got to scale down a little bit, don't be so egotistical that you got to show off your muscles in your fitness. Like if you, the goal is to get everybody on the crew to work out, scale it and make it where they, they feel, you know, they don't feel completely defeated when they get in there. You know, they finally, after six months of prying on them, get them in the gym and all the other guys are fucking blowing you know, 400 pounds on the bench and, you know, doing a hundred burpees in a row and, <laughs> and they get in there like they, you know, they can't do 10 burpees and, and right. they feel like shit, you know? And so what do they do? They get embarrassed. Right. They quit. So yep. if that's what you're doing, like, if that's your approach, you're, you're losing people. And I guess like at the end of the day, like that's been one of the biggest lessons for me is like, you have to just start small, man. Like you can't expect everybody just to be boom. Like, Oh yeah. You know, understanding this or that, you know, like, Freeman ratio with hose and, you know, and nozzles and all this stuff like that is like for a lot of guys, that's really a hard pill to swallow. Like when you're just trying to talk about basic hose line management and, you know, when to pull the right line and why to pull, you know, you know, when you're, when you're starting basic, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of something what you have to do. Sometimes you have to kind of just come, come, come down to here, like start small digestible pieces, you know, don't give the baby the steak, so to speak. You got a new guy, you're trying to teach him, <laughs> you're trying to teach him freaking ropes and he doesn't even know how to tie a bowl in. Or, or a figure eight, <laughs> and you're trying to teach him how to do a you know five to one hauling system. You know, it's like yeah. you're gonna lose him. You you can't give yep. the baby a steak. You know, and and I'm not saying like that to be derogatory to anybody because there's a lot of people that like I said, you just don't know what you don't know. And sometimes right. like it's easy to overwhelm people with knowledge. It's it's over to overwhelm them uh, to try to you know push them too hard too fast and and guilty. I, you know, I've been there where it's like, hey, you need to you know learn this and this and this and this, and then they choke. On the big old piece of meat, you just shove down their throat because they're still trying to figure out what the hell you said like two weeks ago about this hose load. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And and you know it's just it's it's funny though. Like you know the mindset thing is so big, right? The the mental side of this job, is, and I'm, I'm glad to see it getting more attention. I know you're really passionate about it, Jake, and we'll kind of shift gears mm -hmm. here a little bit. But I want to talk for a few minutes about the importance of you know mental preparation and how the brain affects performance, both both in training and on the job. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's key. And once, once I learned this, there's no unlearning it. So the most dreaded thing that I teach at my department that people, tr a lot of people truly hate is SEBA confidence courses. Um, but I think it's one of the absolute most critical skill to master. Uh, not because you're learning your air pack, which you are, uh, but it's one of the best ways to get you almost into an amygdala hijack. So uh, for those who don't know, like everything we do, reasoning stuff comes from our prefrontal cortex. You know, when we put our keys down, when we come to work, uh, we know where they are. We know where our phone is. That's our reason. We're able to think and reason, right? But when we go to that amygdala, when we go to that, that fight or flight or freeze, then reasoning and thinking clearly is just out. You just can't do it anymore. And it's just when you panic and you just, you can't think, you don't have, like, like you only have the linear thought. And usually it's, I have to, I, I want to fight, I want to run, or I can't do anything. You lock up. And it's it's one of those things that we we can't, we need to get people to recognize when they're doing the transition, how to slow it or stop it. And also how to, 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 if you start dipping your feet in that, in that amygdala pool, then you have to learn to pull it out. And then also, since we do everything in teams, have that team member recognize when somebody is starting to panic or get that amygdala hijack. So when I do my SEBA uh, confidence course, I, I try to make it to where people will get to the point where they panic a little bit because they can't, they can't get hurt in this. Now I say that, and I know people have gotten hurt in, in, in those things. Uh, I've had people where I'm at get hurt in those things. Um, but you're not going to die. You're not going to do anything like that. So it's a great way to learn this, this skill. So 
when you start to panic and you start to go to that amygdala hijack and we've all been there, you know, uh, it's just when you ever get in like a really big fight with your wife and you just end up saying the dumbest things, and you don't know why you're saying them, you know, that's that amygdala hijack when you just panic sometimes and just, you know, dump stuff out of your mouth. So for me, I didn't even know what one of my triggers was. And one of my triggers doing the SEBA confidence course was whenever my helmet got stuck in this little tiny thing, I freaked out. So the first time it, it happened, I was really about to lose it. I couldn't get my head. I couldn't move in any direction. So I was embarrassed. And so I said, okay, what are you going to tell? What, okay, what are you going to tell? What would you tell your people to do in this situation? So I talked myself down and that's what really got me thinking about it and started me looking at what happened to me. After I did that though, and I recognized that that made me panic, I went around and, and got my head stuck in, in different ways. And I never panicked after that. I, I didn't. I'm like, that is so interesting. I like created something that my body thought was life or death, but it wasn't. And I was able to recognize what it was and then teach myself to come down from it. So one of the things um, I've got a new one for me, but I'll tell you uh, first how if you recognize it in somebody at your department doing training or at a fire or whatever, um, is when you go into that amygdala hijack, like I said, you can't think, you're not reasoning anymore. You can't. So you want to get people in that prefrontal cortex. You want them to start be able to reason and think through skills. So, uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll do it to you all right now. Uh, you're not having an amygdala hijack, but your brain will still do the same thing. Uh, what was the third, the color of the third car you owned? You can't answer it, right? Right now, you got to think about it for a while. So if you're panicking and somebody says something that, obscure to you, that pulls you out of that amygdala right into your prefrontal cortex because now you're starting to think. Like if you do it to some, I have done it to, there was somebody that really, really didn't want to do this, uh, this newer confidence course. And this person's eyeballs were this big. I already saw that she was getting into an amygdala hijack. And I looked and I said, what was the second scariest movie you ever saw? And she went, uh, I guess it was, I mean, just, just like that. Now, they don't always stay, so you might have to redo that, but it's any obscure question you can come up with, right? You know, you know, uh, how tall was your dad? You know, just anything that snaps them out of that. It's such a valuable tool, and you can use it all over the place. So for me, the one recently that I started doing was I had a couple of situations where I was I was there. I mean, I was, I was just as into it as uh, – I was getting to the point to where I probably – I don't know. I was probably have to get some help, but I recognized, you know, I had enough thought. I was like, okay, wait a minute, walk through your house as a kid. And that's what I did. I, in my mind, I walked down, I went through my front door and then I was like, what picture was on that wall? And I did that all the way through my house and my blood pressure came down. My pulse came down. I was able to reason and think again. So it, it's something that we can do if we recognize the signs and we practice with it and more importantly, help other people that are going into those amygdala hijacks. So I think it's amazing. I hope everybody looks it up. A uh, good friend of mine from uh, Fairfax, Rob Lissetti, uh, teaches a lot of this stuff. And it's just, you know, you want to get in that flow state, right? You want to be just where everything is nice and smooth and productive and efficient. But if something goes awry and you feel like your body feels like it's in, in imminent danger, you'll hit that amygdala then, then you could be done because your blood pressure goes up, pulse goes up, and you breathe fast. So if you're in an SEBA, that could be, it could be exponential, you know? So it's really interesting. I, and, uh, just think about it. For, like everybody talks about 9-11. Like where were you guys on 9-11? Think about it. When you found out about 9-11, right? So you immediately go there, right? You know exactly what you were doing. What were you doing 9-12? Right? You got to think about it. So anytime you could do that, any sustained thinking like that, uh, you could pull people out of that. Man, I love that. That's I'm gonna have to research that some more because it's one of those things that uh, I'm I'm passionate about. Maybe not in that that uh, that much depth, right? Um, but I always learn too, like how you breathe. That plays. Like, think about running on a treadmill, right? You mm -hmm. put that sucker at like a 7% incline at eight miles an hour. You're just, you're just going and you're, <laughs> you're like, Oh my God, I'm going to die right now. And then you just take, <laughs> you know, take that nice deep breath and you just kind of like let it out and you do a couple of those and you realize like, Hey, I'm good. I'm fine. Yeah, exactly. That's so, it. Yeah. Um, 
I wrote an article about SCBA confidence in Firehouse Magazine not that long ago. I think it was like last year, maybe the year before. Anyway, one of the things I talked about is from personal experience is I never appreciated the bell of my SCBA, right? Because I never had it sucked to my face except in training, which what did they say? Just take it off. Right. Right. Oh, okay. So it never clicked to me that like I was in any danger until I was in a fire. And granted, we were doing overhaul and stuff like that. It wasn't that that big of a deal but it still wasn't that well ventilated and i'm like oh i got time doors only like 10 feet behind me right we're good and that thing sucked to my face and i thought i was going to die i couldn't get to that door fast enough first thing i did is rip that sucker off in the front yard so from that day on morning checks i turned my bottle on put my mask on turn the bottle off and i bleed it down and i see how many of those masks sucks to my face can i get before I absolutely feel like I'm going to pass out. And you just How try many and get, get? Right now, about five or six, depending on, you know, what I was doing before that. <laughs> so, um, but my goal is to always at least meet what I did previously, but, but try and get one more and one more. Right. Like you said, to that reset of like, hey, I'm okay. I'm fine. So that if that ever happens to me in a fire, I know, Right. You've built time. that Rolodex. It's not, it's not a surprise to your brain anymore. It's not right. like, like the first one for you. Oh shit, I'm going to die. And you ran out and ripped it off. Right. And kudos to you for like, that. that's not going to happen twice. So right. now you're teaching your brain. This is okay. We got, we got time. We got time. And, and you're, you're actually preventing yourself from having that again. That's amazing. I love that. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah I mean, Good. Let me ask you, I just want to ask, you know, both of you guys this, I mean, um, when you're, when you're teaching, uh, obviously you, you, you walk before you run. I get that, but how, how important is it in both of your opinion? I'm just curious, um, to, to kind of acclimate, not just your body, but your mind to those environments. You know, we talk, and I think part of the resiliency is kind of get, it gets thrown out there. I know there's a lot of classes on resiliency going now or not a lot, but a handful of guys that are doing them. And, um, but you know, you've heard the stress inoculation uh, that's been thrown around in military and stuff, uh, mm-hmm. over the years and fire service over the, probably, I, I first heard in the fire service probably a decade ago. Um, but the concept of, of purposely getting people to acclimate to those stressors, whether it being, you know, having weight or being in tight spaces or, you know, worms or having that mask sucked to your face and knowing what that feels like, um, how important is it to you guys to, to, for your, for your own personal training, but in, and also for the people that you train and, and, and work with, um, to, to really kind of push them to, Hey, step outside the comfort zone a little bit, let your, you know, work through some hard things. Um, so that, that when you are hit in the face with that, it, it doesn't, you know, you don't just go into this like berserk, like state of Holy <laughs> shit, I'm dying. Like you said, <laughs> to, to train yourself to come down because like, I'm, I'm telling you, man, it's crazy. You read like NIOSH reports, when the body does weird things, when it gets freaked out, like when, when we get freaked out, our brain goes berserk and we do crazy stuff like ripping our PPE off in the middle of a raging flash over fire, you know, ripping our mask off, you know, we're 10 feet from a door and people are screaming, you know, for, for you. And we run deeper into the fire and, and things like that. And like, and that that's happened and man, that, and that's no like knock on anything or anybody like, but it is amazing what the body does in those circumstances. So, you know, the goal in training, at least in my mind, is I want to put myself in as many of those positions in training in a controlled setting where I can mimic some of those things mm-hmm. so that when I get faced with that, I know, you know, my it's not the first time my body or my brain has been exposed to it. You know, I hear guys in Florida when I was in Florida all the time talking about heat acclimation and the importance of putting your gear on in the heat and working in the heat and building up that tolerance. Um I, I truly believe the the brain, honestly, uh, it, even more so needs to be exercised. Even more so needs to be mm-hmm. worked on. I, and I just want to get your thoughts on that. I, I I really am just curious on when you know when you guys are going around talking to people. If you find that you know people are kind of standoffish with that, or if it's something that a lot of people are open to, you know, it's been a mixed bag for me. Some people are willing to to push those limits, <laughs> and just just maybe it's just out of curiosity. And there's a lot of guys like, hell no, I'm not going to that tight space or hell no, I'm not, you know, <laughs> like that is not happening. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like, uh, I, I forget where I read this and I apologize for not giving the right credit, but I read this this one time. And so I use it all the time. Uh, I get recruits and stuff that don't like heights or ladder. It's not that they don't like heights. They don't like the heights 
on ladders, being 35 foot up on a 35 foot ladder or climbing an aerial. And I always tell them, I'm like, it's not that you're afraid of it because you've never done it. You're just unfamiliar with it. Let's get familiar with it. And I will try to encourage them to do that. But <clears throat> I think for myself, I would push myself exactly like you're, like you're talking about. I, I mean, I have in the past. I actually, I mean, I've done it um, way harder than I can push anybody as a training officer, right? Um, there was a time where me and uh, a friend of mine, uh, JT, we would go out and we'd work out outside no matter how hot it was. And what we do is we take hose and he would drag it for a block, three inch hose. We take off running and he'd go one block to the other. Now, while he did that, I did push ups and then we would switch. I would run with the hose and run back. And then why he had to keep doing push ups. So uh, I, I, we call them fuck your buddies because if you went slow, you're doing more, the other guys do more push ups. Uh, so we were doing that and man, we were just loving it. And it was hot and we were sweaty. And all we got was hate, man. We got so much hate. Like, man, you guys are embarrassing us. You look stupid out there. And, you know, what if we get a fire and you're just, you know, you're just zonked and you can't do nothing. And, and man, that was so disheartening. And I'm like, you know, I don't expect an attaboy, but I don't want to screw you either, man. I mean, just if you can't say nothing nice about it, don't say nothing at all. But we would do it. And we were, I mean, one time I had a captain come out. It was 105 degrees uh, heat index. And we were just finishing up and he came out and he goes, what are you doing, boy? And I said, just about done. He goes, get in here. That's an order. He goes, I don't give many orders, but you get in here right now. And I mean, I was, I was getting used to it. I'm like, you know, this, I'm trying to get used to the heat and all that stuff. And JT, we, I thought we were doing something good, you know? So for us, we could do it, but I just don't think as a training officer that that's a tool that I could use. I can encourage it. I used to do uh 1% drills. And uh, so my problem was I can't design drills for the guys that are just all day, go hard, you know, work their nuts off. And I can't design drills for guys that sit on the couch all day. So I try to sit in the middle. Well, some guys were just really complaining. A lot of the newer guys, I'm like, not complaining in a bad way. They're like, man, I just wish you could do more to your point. And so I designed another drill. I said, it's an optional drill. After every drill that I designed, I came up with a second one and it was completely optional. Now, my like, guys, if you want to do the optional drill, it's the one percent drill. So, I mean, I didn't call it the one percent drill. I got called the one percent drill, and it was doing really, really well. Uh, I had people that had been on the fire department for a while that did the original drill and rolled right into the one percent drill. I had guys that were young and aggressive and couldn't finish the drill, and they loved that they couldn't finish it. They were like, "Oh my god," you know, because that stress inoculation. They were so exhausted, so beat up, but they had to do it themselves. Um, I, I had that shut down, unfortunately, but I'd give anything to have that back because to me, it's the perfect balance as a training officer. Now, imagine back. Let me throw it back on you. Think about smoke divers. I mean, that's exactly what they're doing, right? They're they're testing their brain. They're testing their body. They're testing their gear and their tactics all at once, nonstop. So can you imagine that? I mean, to your point, like they're they're like just just next level across the board holistically. Yeah, that's such a great point about smoke divers. And I'll tell you right now, like I'm not a, I'm not ashamed to say it. I give all those guys credit, even the ones that try and, and are not successful, because I look oh, yeah. at some of the stuff they do, and I'm like, fuck that. I, I own it. I say it all the time, right? And I'm I'm not afraid to punish myself. I just mm -hmm. that is that is at a whole new level, right? Much respect to those guys. To answer your question, Nick, <laughs> people at work think I am absolutely insane. Because <laughs> I'm a cardio person and I will get on that treadmill, shut the AC off in the weight room and have a sweatshirt on and go for a run, hood on and everything. And they're like, what are you doing? And then they'll come in and I'll have my weight vest on top of that, you know, just going to town. And I tell them the same thing. Hey, man, I'm punishing myself, right? Like I'm testing my boundaries. One, I want to see like when my mind says, this is hard. Stop. Or when my legs are tired and I just want to quit, I say, not today. And I just keep going. Right. Even if it's just for one more minute or two more minutes, whatever that is, I shoot for 30 as a whole. And, and for the most part, I get there, but it's that heat acclimation, right? I can't train in my gear like I'd like to. Right. Um, you know, especially with the PFAS stuff coming out now and, and the IAFF, like, no, you can't do this. And policies are policies. I'm not going to break them. So 
Although I might do that on my days off while I'm at work, I can't do that. So what's the next best thing? A sweatshirt or something that to get me physically hot. And, and, you know, Jake, I've heard the same thing from people. Oh, what if we get a fire? Great. Let's go. Yeah. You know what? It wasn't that, that long ago where we did, we did get a fire. And granted, like, I'm not going to paint some picture. Like I did all these like great things while we were there at that fire, but I was able to maintain a level of performance that I was comfortable with after doing the Murph on duty. Now the Murph took me two hours to do. Don't get me wrong. Cause I paced myself on purpose. Mm -hmm. Moral of the story is that's a very intense physical workout. I completed it. And five minutes later, we got a three alarm fire. Right. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And you know, like I said, I'm not going to sit there. Like I was on a hand line, like pushing stairs and all that other stuff and whatever. But my point being is, I was still in my gear. I was still had to perform duties, right? Mm -hmm. Put a two and a half in play, you know, do all these other things, go do overhaul, break some windows out. Like all the things that I was asked to do, I still had to perform. And not one single time was I like, man, I'm too exhausted for this. And that's the power of it. Like physically (laughs) I was not comfortable, but mentally I knew like, I'm okay. I can keep working. And that's what I try and push to people. But you're right, man. You can't force that on anybody, right? You, that's no, you got to have that gonna... internal drive, right? You got to have that right. drive like you're talking about. You're like, you know, I'm doing this and this is what's going to happen. And I'm, I love what you said about the brain, though. It's, I mean, honestly, you can push yourself physically as hard as you want, do the, the most crazy things. But it comes down to your mental capacity. Sure. Because you could have all the muscles in the world. But if your brain's not with you, if you're not mentally there, like I want to push myself, I want to see my limits. It doesn't matter how big or little you are, you know, it's so when you're doing all that stuff, that's just kind of a a means to an end, because like you said, it's your brain, your brain's going to tell you whether or not you're done or not. Right. So as you do what you're doing, you might be exhausted. You might be feeling it, but your brain's like, no, nah, we're good. We're good. We've been we're a lot good. harder just today. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you, no. you, your body can do more than, you know, here's the, here's the beautiful thing about it. If you can shut your mind off, if you can tell your, you know, kind of give yourself the mental, that, that bitch voice, like Goggins calls it, if you can turn yeah. the bitch voice off and say, Hey, you know, no, we're good. Like I'm going to keep moving. It's amazing what you can actually, that's, you know, you always hear about people getting their second win. Most people never see the second win because they never push past that uncom- yeah. uncomfortable level of like, oh, I don't feel, oh, I don't, this sucks. Well, yeah, it does suck. But lean into the suck a little bit and just say, hey, you know what? I'm not quitting. I got to work. And, and for the people to say, well, you know, you shouldn't work out on shift because you might get a fire. You could have a fire, come back to the firehouse and five minutes later, get another fire. Like yep. that, that does happen from time to time. I would rather 99% of the time, I'm going to be able to get my workout in without some five alarm fire. Every once in a while, you're going to get caught, and that's the way it is. Like, but I would much rather be moving and preparing myself, right, physically, mentally for the job, than to sit there and like, oh, I'm just going to sit on my ass all day, sedentary. And, and here's what you know: for people that work in the South, I can tell you this, man. Like, that heat's a real deal, and I've seen this on so many fires. Guys that sit in the AC all damn day, and they don't get out in the heat ever. They, they want to avoid the heat. You know, they, they don't want to get out in it. And all of a sudden you've been in the AC for five, six hours and they get a fire. Guess what? Do you think that they're feeling great when they get in their gear and they get out of that truck and it's a hundred, <laughs> hundred degrees outside with 80% humidity. And they're feeling like just, just a sweat box. If they haven't been conditioning and preparing themselves for that environment, they're not going to perform at the, at their best level. The guys that mm-hmm. perform at their best level are the guys you know, being smart. We're not trying to have a heat stroke I, during training, doing five hours out in the middle of the sun all day. Like on shift, I get that. You got to be smart about it. But if you get out there 15, 20 minute spurts, right? Put your gear on, do some cardio, do some calcinics, do some, you know, uh, you know, do a little bit here, a little bit there. Over time, your body adjusts. And Sean, you can attest to this. I mean, you were down in Florida for a quite a quite a while. I mean, you you have to, you have to get out there and, and acclimate to that that heat because if you don't, it'll kick you right in the throat. Like it will humble you real quick and in a hurry if you've been sitting in the AC for hours and hours and hours and you don't go outside and, and move around. I mean, guys used to go, oh, it's too hot to train. Well, let's do it in the morning then. First thing in the morning or after the sun goes down, let's have a down day or the, the heat of the day and get out there, but at least get out and move. Put your gear on, go run a drill, go out and do some PT as a crew, sweat a little bit, get your bones moving, get your body moving, get your body used to that, that, 
constriction of you know having your pack on having your gear on pulling hose putting your mask on because like i said all that stuff adds up but if you don't ever push yourself there right and, and learn to turn your bitch voice off and and say hey okay am i okay can i physically continue to work and more often than not man we can do more than what we realize like we can do more than when when that first inkling to quit comes we usually have way more in the tank than what we give ourselves credit for and how do we know? Yeah, exactly. And how do we know how much is left, right? Like on our car, we know because it says you got 36 miles left, right? When you get so low and you don't know. And so when people say, well, you, you know, what if we get a fire, don't work out? Well, my argument is if we have a fire and we don't work out, how do we know our limits? How do we know what feels right and what doesn't feel right? You know, we got to push ourselves. And, it, you know, I would love to say on duty that we should say, hey, do it for your family, do it for your wife, blah, blah, blah. I kind of don't subscribe to that theory off duty. That's for you. But when you're there at work, you need to be always there. Do it for them. Do it for your crew. You know, that's that's the expectation. I would hate for someone to not save somebody, not make the push uh, because they they're out of air, you know, 10 minutes into it. Right. And they couldn't get to a kid. And I guarantee you it's happened. Right. I guarantee you it's happened. And but their brains probably protect them. Oh, they were they were dead before we left the station. Well, what if that wasn't the case? What if it was just right around the corner, but you ran out of air or you couldn't take it anymore? You quit. You know, you got to know your limits. You got to know what your body can do. You got to know what your brain can do. And you got to test them consistently. And I just, I don't subscribe to that. You know, don't work out the firehouse. Almost everybody that's told me that hasn't seen their feet in years. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. You're like, you know, yeah. I may not take advice about health from you. It's like going to a dentist with really bad teeth and him saying, you need to brush your teeth a lot more. I'm like, are they perceived limits or are they hard limits? Are they actual limits? And, and, and like you said, the only way you know what a hard limit is, is you got to flirt with that line every once in a while. You got to know for yourself you know, what you can and can't do and what you can put, you know, and I think like that's, that's, I kind of, kind of summing up the, the, the context of like the brain and how it affects our job. Like uh, you have to condition your mind and your body. It's, it's a, it's a two, you know, two piece thing. Um, if you don't ever, you know, you can work out and be in great shape physically, but if you don't mentally push yourself to those walls, if you always stay in your comfort zone, mm -hmm. you know, and you never push those, because I've seen guys in, in good physical health, um panic freak out bail out you know uh not be able to take it not be able to you know or or hit that wall and just like they're done and, and they're i gotta go um and i've seen guys that you look at and like look average conditioning maybe you know maybe a little dad bod going on and you know the i had this captain when i first started the guy blew my mind i was young 18 years old coming out of the fire service i was excited i thought i could outpace this guy and he would every fire for like my first year would destroy me. i'm like how the hell this dude's like pushing 50 you know and for me at 18 i was like this guy's old he's walking around and saying his back hurts all the time <laughs> you know and we would go to the fire and or, or training or whatever and i was like how the hell is this guy like but he had hit that wall he knew where his limits were and he understood like hey i don't have to be comfortable for me to keep working and he dude he would he would just smoke me man and part of it was technique <laughs> too but he'd just look over me like you know i'd be running out of the area like again come on man you know give me a hard time just and i was like how the hell is this guy like i like i'm running at this point i was in the gym like i was in great shape right out of fire academy like i'm running like five times a week like i'm like come on there's no way that this old dude is gonna but but what it was is he had built grit and tenacity and resilience because he'd been pushed against that wall so many times and he knew the yeah. difference between perceived limits and actual hard limits and yeah. i tell you what man uh, that was a big eye opener for me as a young fireman that I realized it's, you have to be, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. You have to purposely yeah. put yourself in that situation. So you know where that line is, because if you don't, uh, that first red flag goes up in your brain. If you've never pushed past that, guess what? Perception is reality. And that'll be your reality. You're, you're coming out. Yeah. Well, uh, the, uh, I was about to say train pulled out of the station. I was going to say something, you got me all excited. Hmm. I'll just sing a song. Yeah, better not do that either. Uh, what's I going to say, man? Oh shit! Nah, it'll come back to me. I'll come. It'll come back to me. <laughs> hey, it was a really good point too. <laughs> it's all coming back to me now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You get to be my age. Shit just kind of flutters away. Yeah, no, it's. I mean, that that's really it. You know, like you said, the, those people that promote, like, like I'm, I'm really blessed 
Uh, I'll be honest. There's, there's not, um, as long as I've been with the city, physical fitness has, has been pretty, pretty high on the priority list. Like, especially, uh, where I'm at now, my whole crew every day, you know, you're, you find us in the gym. Some will work out in the morning. Most of the time we all work out in the afternoon between three and four and we're in there together. My Lieutenant driver, firefighter, like, and there, if there's four of us for that day, we're all four doing stuff, you know? And it's, I tell everybody, not only is it that bonding moment that you get with your crew, but you look around and you get a kind of a gauge of what everybody's abilities are. Like that guy's right. really strong. This dude can run for, you know, hours. Like just, you know, your crew just by sitting there and working out with them. And to me, that, that in itself is powerful because oh, yeah. when you get to a tough job, you know, like you have that comfort behind you, like, all right, I'm with a bunch of guys that can work. And while, although I might not be as strong as him, like we all can carry our own weight here. And that's super important. And when you get detailed out somewhere and you don't know anybody, man, I can't speak for anyone else, but I'm a little worried every day. Not, not that <laughs> they're out of shape or anything, just cause maybe I haven't worked with them yet. And I don't right. know what to expect. Whereas with my crew, I know like, Hey, fitness is a priority. We eat pretty healthy. Like we do all these things. Like I know, when something happens, we're going to make it through it. We're going to, we're probably going to be all right. Um, I can't say that for everybody. And I, God, I wish I, I wish we could all of us, you know, but that, yeah. that's just reality. So you got to be that example, unfortunately. And if you're not currently on that crew, find where that crew is and try and get there. We have, uh, we're, we're starting a, the, a physical fitness program, kicking it off in September and we're doing the uh, fit to thrive uh, for the, from the international. So we're all certified mm -hmm. and we're working on delivering this. So everybody's kind of, I don't know the feeling I get. Not everybody's excited about having this fitness program, probably because they don't understand what it's going to be yet. Uh, but what's really great is people are starting to now do all start to exercise because they're prepping for it because they don't know what it's going to be. Um, and I've tried to tell them, you know, it's not, you know, it's going to be a lot of mobility, flexibility, and all this. And so what they're doing is as a group, they're going, and I've never seen this before. They're going to the, uh, what's called river run. It's a really nice little, uh, uh, swim park in our town and it's got this lazy river. So they're, they're, they come up to me and I work out every morning. They know that about me. I run, I lift, I do all that. I'm not huge. I'm just, I try to stay consistent and healthy for my job. I always tell people I, I try to stay fit. I think that's a good example. Right? Mm -hmm. So they're like, Hey chief, man, you need to come to river run. We, we walk, we walk the lazy river backwards and I'm like, well, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I guess I can try, but you know, and I told him this too. I, I straight up told him this. I, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, eh, that's, that's not much, you know, and that was an arrogant way to take it. And I was wrong. So two days ago, we went to the lazy river for swift water training. They turned that lazy river up to five miles an hour. I think it was. And I was walking against the current like they do for the exercise and I was proven wrong. That was tough. That, I mean, I was, I was like, this is not told him. I said, guys, I, I'm so sorry. This, this is incredibly difficult. And so, but they're doing that as a team, as a crew and other uh, crews now like a shift, B shift, C shift, just about everybody now in the morning will go to that. The, the majors will let them go to the, the lazy river. If they walk that a bunch of times against the current, which is difficult. I can attest to that. And then they go and uh, float, uh, tread water for 15 minutes. And they're all getting ready for this, this fitness program. So I'm kind of hoping that that excitement and that teamwork, they're, they're developing that now and that'll carry over into our fitness. So yeah, I, I love it. I mean, that's being fit is not just that. It's not just like you got to be in good shape to do our job. It it's the teamwork. It's finding your limits. It's acclimating. It's all these things. I've never met anybody that that does cardio or or or, ex, or works out regularly that runs the same distance at the same speed at the same incline ever. I've never met anybody that lifts the exact same weight that they've always lifted ever. They always push themselves. So if we can get them in that that mindset, uh, then I think it'll naturally take over. I think if I get people doing this program, that they will get better, stronger, faster, mo more mobility, more everything on their own. I don't think that's something I'm going to have to build in because I think naturally we, we want to be better. And I think you can tap into that a little bit. Oh, It'll be I a think, pride thing at the yeah. end. 
Yeah, you know, right. they'll, they'll be proud of that, and they'll and they'll see what they're capable of doing. They'll have that that uh, confidence in themselves, and they, they'll just take straight off from there. That's why I got sunburned, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Looks great. That, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm handsome anyway. I don't care what I got. I put a football helmet on backwards, and I'm still great looking. So, yeah, man, great, great points. I mean, you know, I think Field says it best when he says sweat is the the currency of our profession. Um, you want to build morale. You want you want to build camaraderie. Sweat together, train. You know, training, working out. Um, you know, working on projects around the station. You know, whatever it is, like do it together. Do it together and put in the sweat equity because it does pay dividends in the back end. And, and here's the thing. We talk about the, the mental side of stuff. Uh, it's important for you to know your limits. But here's the thing. How much value is it if you not only know your own limits, but the guys next to you know your limits too because they've seen you and they've been with you in the trenches when you hit that wall. When mm-hmm. they know your limits and you know their limits and there's that intimacy, that, that, com- that common thread of like, hey, you know, I've seen this guy hit that wall. I know what that look like. It looks like in his face. Like I know, you know, when he's, you know, it's tough, but he's still good. Like he's good. Leave him alone mm-hmm. to, Hey, oh, shit. I've seen that look before. He's about to go down, like grab his ass. You know? um, there's a lot to be said for that. And, and mm-hmm. there's a lot to be said for putting the work together as a team like that and, and, and embracing the suck, so to speak. Um, and, and putting in that sweat equity so that you can, push those limits together so that you can see you know where those lines are and like i said everybody's lines can be different that's fine but as a team when we're working together and we're working out and we're you know there's that friendly competition and that friendly camaraderie um that starts to develop what ends up happening i start to know like hey i know when this guy's good or if he's having an off day i know when yeah, man, he just doesn't look right, or he's you know he's not hitting his marks like he normally does. Like something's off, right? And and it's it's becoming you know by doing those things together, that becomes like you know I think Corley Moore talks about the the you know four gas meter about monitoring the atmosphere for culture. Well, it's the same mm-hmm. thing with with our physical and mental well being, right? When we are putting in work and we're used to seeing what normal looks like and what they're they're able to do uh whether it's a new recruit whether it's a senior guy whatever when we do it all together like we know what normal looks like and so when there's something off we may not know exactly what's off but we know something's off and it's right. the same thing with mental health it you know when when you get used to a guy like you know if he's usually upbeat and all of a sudden he's his last couple of shifts he's been really under like just melancholy and under the weather like that's out of character that should start prompting questions for us to go like hey man like what's going on here like this is not like you um and and the only way we're ever going to pick up on those little subtle things is if we're we're putting in the work day in and day out when we're at work together and we're Mm -hmm. constantly pushing that needle together to be better and that's you know obviously you can't you can lead people to the water you can't always make people take that extra, that 1% drill and go that extra mile. But man, what a powerful thing it is when you guys, when you get buy-in from guys mm-hmm. and they are working out together and they are training together and they are willing to go that extra mile, man, when you get to that place, that's a powerful place as a crew, as a, as a shift, as a department, when you get to the place where people are, are rubbing shoulders in the trenches together and putting in work, it builds, it builds camaraderie and morale. It does it period. Like if you want to improve the way people feel about the, how people feel about the job and the way they approach the job, um, get to that place, get to that place. And it's hard, right? It's not easy to convince to step outside of that comfort zone. It's not easy to be vulnerable in front of people it's not easy to feel in front of your peers, but man, if you can get to the place where it's okay to like, let people see you struggle and fail and, and get back up and do it again and get back up and do it again. Like, Man, you talk about being able to move mountains, man, and at least on your shift. I mean, you may not change your department, but you can change a lot of stuff in your own firehouse just by, you know, one or two guys getting together and the next, you know, three guys and four guys. And you start getting everybody to, to buy in. Um, that's that's such an incredibly, incredibly powerful place to be. And I can tell you, man, I've been on both sides of it, of, of crews that have, have had buy in and guys that haven't. And it's tough okay. for the guys that are listening to this that are on the other side. Like, man, I don't know how I'm going to get these guys to buy in. It really is. It's baby steps, man. It is baby steps. And sometimes it is like pulling teeth, man, to get guys in the gym, to get guys to go a little extra in training or, you know, but, but it is amazing to me over time. If you're consistent, how that starts to like one guy, you know, next thing, you know, it's one guy and you're by yourself. And, you know, after six months, maybe a year, 
maybe maybe if you're lucky, you got another guy coming in. Next thing you know, you got another guy just curious. They might be poking funny of you initially, but they're curious. They're looking, and it takes time, right? And I think that's what guys get frustrated. They they don't they're not patient enough to to just stay with it over time, and and it's it's easy to get frustrated. And like nobody cares, but I think more people care than what they let on. A lot of people will put on the tough guy persona, or they don't want to be on cool with a certain captain and talk shit about everybody. Um, but there's yeah. a lot of people watching, and I would say, like, don't be afraid to keep putting in work because eventually, other people, the right kind of people, are going to get attracted to it. And you know, you flip the script on people, right? All of a sudden, when when you know four of the five guys on the crew are out there working out, that fifth guy feels really alienated. All of a sudden, <laughs> right? Well, there's a you thing know? called the bandwagon effect, <clears throat> you know, where people they don't want to. Most people don't want to ruffle feathers, and if they're within a group of people. What that group does or think, generally, that person will stick with that group, right? So it's a bad thing because if, you, if you've if you got somebody, a good example, you got somebody um, around a bunch of negative firefighters where all they do is hate all day. They're just, they drink haterade. They just, they just hate. That person doesn't want to step outside and go, hey, guys, that's not right. We should probably, you know, nobody wants to do that. They just stay in that little group because it's easy. Well, the good news is about that, the bandwagon effect works the other way too, to your point, where if you're, if you're working out constantly and you set that consistency and you get one person to come in and then another person to come in, that bandwagon effect is working for you too now because they want to be part of your group. They want to see, okay, what's going on here? There's a great video on YouTube of this guy at a dance. He's at a, a music festival and he's all by himself on this hill in the grass dancing. Have you seen that? Yeah. And he, He's dancing just, it, it looks so weird and it makes you uncomfortable. And then all of a sudden one person comes over another and the groups of them. And then there's hundreds of people dancing with him all nuts at this. That's the bandwagon effect. Nobody wanted to be with him at first. Cause it looked weird. And the group they're with are like, that's going on. And then finally somebody said, fuck it. I want to, I want to go over there and do, I want to have fun like this guy. So you can use that bandwagon effect. Exactly. Like you said, Hey, it's just two of us in here now Then it's three of us. And that last guy that that holdout, he's going to want to be with with that group. So he, you have to make it easy for him. You can't you can't shame him into it at that point because then he'll never do it. You know our egos, right? So yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that. Uh, but if you consider that bandwagon effect and how you can manipulate that to the good of the department, to the good of the community. Oh, hundred percent. One of the things too is like, if you have that person, quite honestly. Like as much as I would love to see them doing what everybody else is doing, just the fact that they had the know know how like to say, you know what, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna go in there with them, even if they're just sitting in the corner and just like talking to everybody while everybody else is doing their thing. Like at least you're present. Like that's a start. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, in in that thing, like if that happens, I would urge people not to try and pick on that person and be like. Oh, where's your workout stuff? Or hey, where's this? Or hey, where's that? Just just be happy they made an effort to be part of the crew. You know, and they mm -hmm. wanted to come and hang out, yeah. you know, and small like Nick said, small baby steps, man. Maybe next next day or a week later, they'll come in with their shorts and and tennis shoes on and start doing something. But the worst thing you can do after they've made that effort is single them out yeah. and make them feel like shit for it. Yeah, especially if you get them in there for a couple of days and then they don't show up that fourth day or fifth day and you go, come on, man, I thought we were, you know, you don't do that, man. I, I always, uh, there was a guy I worked with that uh, I, my goal was to get him in the gym at the department for 10 minutes. I don't care what he did. So I finally asked him to uh, spot me. And so I, they got <laughs> him in the gym. I said, hey, man, spot me yeah. this real quick. And then I, we just started talking about fire department stuff and all that. And he was in there for 10 minutes. I'm like, yes, I got him yeah. in there. And then it was like, <laughs> yep. next time, I'm like, Hey man, we come over and help me move this, yeah. you know, move this over here or whatever. And, uh, so yeah, you gotta, you get, you can't look at the, at the, at the success through your lens. It's their lens. Right. So oh, yeah. just getting him in there, I think was good for him. And he, he works out and he takes care of himself and everything, but now, but, uh, you just gotta trick people maybe sometimes in there or, uh, let them feel how good it feels. To, to work out how you ever, I don't care who you are. If you, if you put in a decent workout, you feel good. You just feel good. It's the yeah. endorphins. You just feel great. Yep. You may not look like you want, you, you may go there for, you know, for two weeks and go, God, you know, I don't look like Chris Hemsworth. Oh, well, <clears throat> but you will feel good day one. 
the the day one you're you will feel so good about it it'll be like a drug and you'll want to go back and back so you got to get them in there you got to get them in there and if they're never going to do it because they want to help the community or anything fine if they do it for them at least they're doing it yeah for sure yep. yeah 100 man it's uh yeah man, it's, it's been a damn good conversation <laughs> we didn't even get to yeah, all the stuff i it. wanted to talk about <laughs> you know what that means we just got to have you back for round two <laughs> yeah we, we didn't time every talk- time we didn't get to talk about 1403. I know that was that was one of the things too. <laughs> oh, that, that's no problem. Uh, yeah. I'll come back anytime you want. Hell yeah, man. Well, thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, so are you ready for rapid fire? I'm ready. You wanna you wanna give get... it the full send? All right. So yes. Best best we can. We're, we're trying to get 60 seconds is is the, the recommended time to answer. Mm-hmm. But uh take take as much time as you need, man. Um I will do my first three, and then I'll let Sean get to his three or four or five or however many questions. He's <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> so, uh, question number one, man. Here we go, rapid fire. Uh, I ask this to everybody because I, I always just am, am intrigued. What is your favorite job on the fire ground? Uh, on, on the on the nozzle, stretch line on the nozzle. Out of doubt, that's nothing better. Amen. That's the only firefighter yeah. on the scene. I don't care what anybody yeah. says. That's the only person fighting fire. Everybody there is just helping. It does my heart good to hear you say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tru- what, what is it? Truckies are the gentlemen of the fire service. They open doors for heroes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that uh, one. That's a good one. I, I got to write that one down. I'm going to use that probably in like 20 minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got to go talk some shit at the pool here at the conference. So, uh, there you go. <laughs> All right, question number two. Um, what do you feel is the biggest challenge facing the fire service today in regards to quality training? Um, getting buy-in. You know, getting buy-in. Most instructors I ever talked to have great ideas, and they design great exercise, great drills. But if you don't get the buy-in from the crew, all of that goes to waste. So you got to find a way to get that that buy-in from them uh, to get the quality training. Cause I mean, you could be the best instructor in the world, but if your guys don't want to be there and they see tra- training as an obstacle, not the opportunity, then it doesn't matter. Man. Damn. That was well put. Well put. Um, okay. So this one's more of a personal question, but, uh, eight inches. It- <laughs> That's the biggest fish I've ever caught was eight inches long. You I knew too, that. Huh? I knew that. Man, I hope you got that thing mounted. <laughs> <laughs> it's Billy Bass. It just talks at you. Yeah. Bass. Wow. I so many mental pictures. I'm not going <laughs> to indulge. <laughs> uh, here we go. I'm I'll turn it over to Sean. Um, for for guys that are looking for some reading material. Uh, to better themselves as, as a person, as a firefighter, whatever. Uh, what is one book that you would recommend to everyone listening to the show? That everybody should read <sighs> if, if they're trying to get better in life. Okay, in general. Two, two come to mind. So I'm going to okay. give you my first pick, but they're side by side. So the first one that came to my mind was Corley Moore's The Nine L's. Yeah. I think that that is awesome. Uh, I took the class. In person, I read the book and then I did the audio book with all the bonus content. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was between that and Step Up and Lead by this QSO. But uh, Corley won on that one. So, yeah, that's the one. Matter of fact, at our uh, leadership conference, mm-hmm. uh, we gave every – or Leadership Academy, we gave everybody a copy of his book. And awesome. he, he he signed them for him. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, book. Fan, fantastic book. Yeah, no, that's a good one. I think it uh, transcends, you know, the beautiful thing about that book is it transcends, you know, really transcends the fire service if you want to get down to it. But for the fire department, uh, doesn't matter what position you're in, like that book, No, to, to me, you know, even as a backseater, like reading that book, like I'm, there's so many nuggets of just getting people to, to like I said, to buy in and to to motivate people and, and, and driving uh, positive change. I mean, it all comes down to leadership and it's not always about bugles on your collar. No, and that's a misconception. It's not about riding the front seat. It's not about having gold on there. It's about caring about the fire department, caring about your crew. Yeah. That that's a leader. You know, you have you can have a a, a pipeman that's a leader, easy. So, one hundred percent. Yeah. Well, well said, uh, Sean. All right. 
So, what has been the most fulfilling fulfilling part of your teaching career? Oh man, teaching for the ISFSI and being able to teach up at uh, New York City and FDNY at the Rock for two years. That was. Uh, I, somebody one time asked me what my goals are in the fire department. Uh, with my time left, I'm like, I've I've exceeded every goal I've had, and that was that was it. It was just amazing. Oh, that's awesome. Not many people can say that they got to go have that experience. So it wasn't me. It was the the cadre I was with. It's not like they said, Jake Barnes got to have him. I, I got to sneak in, I guess, with all these great instructors, but still yeah, the, the experience no. was the same. It was the Absolutely. Same. see my champo just walk around, you know, <laughs> I'm like, that's my champo right there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Walking tall, right? Oh man. <laughs> um, how important is mindset? in regards to performance. And I know you kind of talked about that a little bit, so I'll, I'll let you kind of expand and see if you get anything that you forgot to touch on. No, it's crucial. And I think when you go to work, you don't want to get your mindset. Don't plan on getting your mindset. Like after you've had your coffee and after you've put your gear on your mindset starts, in my opinion, when you leave the house, going to, going to work, you know, from that, you don't, you need to really focus on what you're doing that day. And I don't care what rank you are. You know, how, what am I going to deliver to the community today? What am I going to deliver to my crew today? Uh, you got to start there. Uh, permission to flip this around real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So for me on the way to, to work every single day, I listen to the same song over and over and over. Uh, it changes. The song may change, but I'll listen to it for like weeks and months at a time. And then I get tired of it. So, uh, it used to be inner Sandman by Metallica. Now it's, uh, if I drink this beer, uh, from, uh, the TV show Nashville. It's just a really good song. What do you guys do when you go to work for that time in the car to, to get to the firehouse? Do you do anything to prep for that day? Oh man, that's, you know, this is, this is where my dork comes out. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> um, I listen, I listen to podcasts, something to get me motivated, you know, a, a different perspective on things. Maybe, um, usually like, uh, the weekly scrap, if I couldn't catch that be you know, when it was, when it was live, I'll listen to that on the way in or the way back home or something like that. But I listen to music this is weird enough. I listen to music when I work out, but when I'm on my way to work, I just, I want to get my mind right. So I feel like mm -hmm. listening to podcasts that, uh, that are about the job help me do that. I get it. Love it. Yeah. For me, uh, I, I got about a 45, 50 minute drive to work. Um, so it's kind of nice, actually. I, I really found that it's um, coming off work, especially to that deep, that transition period of being able to kind of reset before I go home. Um, so coming to and from work, though, you know, going to work, it's usually uh, I usually start my morning off. I got a little devotional thing I listen to for, you know, a few minutes. And then uh, I usually have a little moment of kind of prayerful reflection, uh, you know, for a few minutes and clear my head. And then from there, it's it's kind of a, a crapshoot. I either listen to a podcast or a lot of times I, I I will just, you know, nothing, just quiet and, and just have time in my own mind to, uh, I would say probably half the time I listen to a podcast after, after my little devotional thing. And then it's, uh, the other half's probably in my own head again, kind of get my thoughts right, sorting my mind out. Um, I don't know. I'm not, uh, I don't usually listen to music in the morning, uh, for on the way to work. That's just me. I just, uh, feel like, having my time to think has been kind of nice. Um, it's the first time I've, I've lived this far away from work. So I'm kind of toying with it. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, my whole, my whole life, uh, I've, I've lived within, you know, 15 minutes of work every time or less. In fact, mm -hmm. my last, when I was in Florida, I was literally, you know, seven tenths of a mile from the firehouse. So I had like zero time to think. Um, <laughs> so now I'm like, Oh, it's, it's kind of, this is kind of cool. I get to kind of just, you know, collect my thoughts for the day and, kind of unwind on the way home and then on the way to work. It's just kind of mentally going through that checklist of stuff I need to do when I get to work and, you know, kind of put myself in, I, I, I hate to say that I'm like my own like hype man, but just kind of like <laughs> mentally like, all right, getting, getting that checklist, you know, like, Hey, I'm going to get there. You know, like I, I, I just tell myself like, Hey, you know, go in and have a good attitude, you know, work your ass off, leave it all on the table. And that's kind of where I put myself mentally is like, you know, going through that little pregame in my head of like, you know, just how, the things that we need to get done for the day, the things that are on the schedule, the stuff I want to, you know, personal stuff I want to get in, you know, I want to, you know, get an extra workout in or, or whatever, or, or, Hey, you know, see if the boss will let us, if we got time to go out and drill on this or, and I don't make my own schedule as a firefighter. So for me, it's, it's more or less kind of rolling with the punches sometimes, but, 
but I think like mentally going in, like with that mindset of like, Hey, you know what? I'm here to serve. I'm here to like play, you know, I'm going to get everything I got and having that time to reflect and just kind of sort things out in my head. Um, has really worked well for me, man. It's, it's, uh, like I said, I'm still toying with it. I've, I've kind of, you know, like I said, half the time I listen to podcasts, the other half it's quiet. I just kind of, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll venture into music. Maybe I'll get some Metallica going. I don't know. Um, I just have really man. Kind of, yeah. Now on the way now on the way home, it's a freaking party. Like, dude, I, I got the <laughs> tunes on. I get, you know, it's nice out right now. It's summertime. So the windows are down and I'm singing to myself. I look like, I look like an 18 year old girl in a traffic light, man. Just going to town, <laughs> singing, having a good time. So. He, must, he must be singing Hanson then. No, it's Taylor <laughs> Swift. <Bop>. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. What's even more shocking is, you know, the lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> you can't go to seven concerts and not learn the song. Oh, I know. <laughs> oh man. All right. One last question for you. Sure. Um, it's not, it's not the one I wanted, but we're going to settle on it. It's all right. Um, that sounds funny. We know, th- we know, obviously there's a lot of, uh, uh, aspiring instructors. Um, you know, I know I get some messages sometimes from people saying, Hey, I'm, I'm looking at trying to get into this. You know, do you have any advice? Things like that. I love getting those, uh, personally, more of uh, the opportunity to tell them what not to do because I learned that the hard way. <laughs> mm-hmm. So my question to you is, um, with that, I know it's kind of a loaded one, but if you had one piece of advice that you could give to anybody who was trying to branch out into that realm of things, what what would that advice be? Uh, branch out into? Into the teaching world. Oh, uh We've talked about the comfort zone a bunch tonight, and honestly, I meant to say that it's just perfect timing. The that there's no growth inside the comfort zone. There's none, and I tell my kids that too. I'm like, when they have these questions and stuff, I'm always like, look, everything good in my life that I've ever achieved is I stepped outside. I was scared to death to do it, terrified to do it. So now it's to the point when something really frightens me to do, like oh, I don't want to, I don't want to take that position or do this or do that. I do it because I know that I'm going outside of my comfort zone and that's where that growth is. So my, my advice would be do it. Just if if it's something you want to do, do it, pull the pin, throw the grenade and you can start small, teach your company something, you know, teach one guy on the company something and branch out because the, the fire firefighters are a subset of everybody in, in the United States. Right. And it's the best group you'll ever be with. Below that, though, is, a, is another subset, and that's the fire instructor. I'm not talking about the ones that get it just for promotion. Or, or, you know, I'm talking about the people that learn stuff and share stuff regularly. There's nothing better than that subset of firefighters is fire instructors because they are the, the wind in the sail of the fire service. They're moving stuff forward, and there's nothing better than being part of that and meeting people like you all and going around the country, meeting other instructors, and it, it's just – I can't tell you how how good it is if you haven't done it, but I promise you, nobody has ever jumped over to be a fire instructor and and taught and go, oh, this is horrible, this sucks. I've never met anybody. They're all like, I had no idea that this this existed. So that would be my advice. Just jump in. Just remember, jump in. Get get your toes wet, then jump in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sharing, sharing is caring. Lots sharing of is nice caring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, brother, it's been an awesome, awesome two hours. Uh, Jake, I appreciate your time this evening. Like I said, we could talk longer than this, I'm sure. But I want to respect the time of our listeners, (laughs) you know. And, uh, yeah, we got to have to have you back so we can continue more of this conversation. It's just been fantastic. Thank you so much. I was so, so excited to be on here and see you guys again and be part of this. It means a lot that you asked me, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, man. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming on the show, man. And and like I said, uh, definitely always good to, to talk shop with you and, and, uh, you know, man, you could just, your love for the job. It's, it, I love it, man. I love you. Just, you just, you love the job and, uh, it makes it easy to talk to you because you are engaged, you're into it and you give a shit and, uh, man, thank you for, for imparting a little bit of your passion and knowledge with the listeners tonight hopefully some folks got some things to take away uh i i had a, a blast it's honestly uh been the highlight of the day i drove all day i was up early this morning and on the road and uh i was a little tired coming into this but man i'm so glad that uh we got this thing going tonight and it just really 
you know, you talk about charging your battery up and filling you up. This is a great way to start the, the morning with the uh, opening ceremonies and everything. But for me, the conference starts tonight um, with this conversation. So thanks, man, for for all the all the, uh, the laughs and the and the the great com you know commentary on on some of the topics we talked about tonight. Um, definitely going to have a round two. We'll have to get you on the schedule sooner than later. Uh, Thank you very and, much. and get to to the rest of the things we were going to talk about that we did because we chased so many rabbit trails. But uh, <laughs> yeah, man, have have a great night, man. And and like I said, uh, let's do it again soon. Thank you, brothers. I appreciate it. Stay safe. Oh, you See too. You. See you, bro. All right.